In the, the room with me today, I have Robin Newton and Andy Allen. And on Starleaf, we have Alex Easton, the, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Sinead Innes, and our new member, who is very, very welcome, Karen Mullen. Good to see you. You're very welcome to the committee, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Looking forward to it. Good, good. Um, so then we'll move on to agenda item one, which is apologies. Um, Sinead, have you an apology for FRA? Yes, Chair, apologies for FRA. Thank you. Move on then to agenda item two. Um, as I've just said there, a well, very warm welcome to Karen, to the committee, um, who's replaced Carol. As a member, can I then just put on the record the committee's appreciation to Carol, both as a member of this committee and as a minister, and um, she will be missed from the committee, and has been missed from the committee, but I'm sure Karen will take up that mantle as well and uh, relieve, relieve Sinead, because Sinead has had a lot of pressure put on her, so she has for the last few weeks, so um, it's good that she's able to share that pressure with, with Karen as well, so that's good, you're very welcome. Um, can I then inform members have been provided with two research papers from me at page 6 and page 53 on sport and disability in Northern Ireland and on female participation in sport and physical activity in Northern Ireland. Uh, members requested these briefing papers following a committee planning day in September. I think Andy and Sinead were the, 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 the two um, main ones that requested these. Can I ask members, are they content to note and to schedule future briefings from RAISE on these important issues when normal business resumes? Are you content with that? Yeah? Yeah, sure, that would be good. Yeah, agreed. Okay, yeah. thank you. Members, before Christmas, the committee agreed to contact all other committees to see if a coordinated committee response to concerns and issues around the Shared Prosperity Fund um, would be possible. A copy of the draft letter is at page 86. The clerk agreed with the chair that this action would, could wait until the new year. However, given the worsening COVID situation after Christmas, we're in, uh, in, current, sorry, we're in a current situation whereby committees are focusing on immediate essential <coughs> business only as years are and I now propose that the committee writes first to the Department of Finance, who have responsibility for the fund, for an update on the status of the fund, and reevaluate the way forward once this response has been received. A response from DFC on the issue to the committee of the 14th December highlighted that the Department of Finance leads the response on the Shared Prosperity Fund on behalf of the Executive and Civil Service, and any requests for further information on this fund should be directed to the Department of Finance. Are members agreed with that approach? Agreed. Agreed? Brilliant. Good, thank you. Um, then, members, you'll be aware of the new draft uh, programme for government is out for consultation. We have requested a briefing from department officials on the PFG in relation to Department for Communities. Members, any comments? Are they content to note that also? No. Content to note? Did you, did you hear me okay yeah. there? Yeah. It's breaking up a wee bit, Chair. Okay, I know um, certainly there have been issues with Starleaf with various meetings this week, but um, I'll, I'll, we'll keep pressing on. If there are any issues, do let me know. Um, members, just to another couple of issues, or another one or two issues, I want, or one issue I want to talk to you about, um, is uh, I had a meeting yesterday with Unison on behalf of a constituency matter, and Unison had highlighted uh, with me issues around the supporting people budget. Um, and issues in connection to staff terms and condition and staff pay. Um, they were led to believe that the housing executive were going to work under the, the agenda for change terms and conditions for many people who do exactly the same job as those people within the statutory sector, but they're not getting the same pay or the same terms and conditions. Um, they also mentioned about the issue around the 10 million workforce um, cost that was awarded to COVID costs that was awarded to the housing executive, um, uh, which many of those supporting people organisations were could avail of um, to support their staff, and I, th that from what I have been led to believe, this this has not happened. Um, so what I have asked them to do is just to send through a letter to the committee. Um, and we'll get it on the hopefully on the agenda for next week under correspondence. I, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be asked around supporting people. I do believe the minister is um, aware, is aware of these, and I think she is trying to work to get these issues resolved. Um, and we certainly want to help her with that. So I'll, I'll bring that back. Are members content that we wait until the letter then arrives into our committee pack next week to progress that? Yeah, 
Okay. Agreed. Then there's just uh, one other thing. Then um, I, we, as a party de delegation, had a meeting with Advice NI this week as well um, on the issues that they have, uh, have brought up, and I'm sure they've met with other parties um, here and met with other members of this committee as well. Um, so, but we'll bring up those issues whenever we're discussing the, the budget and um, our on agenda item number five, I think that is. Um, so, members happy enough. I just wanted to met, make members aware that I'd met with both of those organisations this week, albeit on a constituency level and a party level. All right? Is that okay, members? Move on? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, agenda item three is our draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes of the 28th of January 2021 on page 89. Can I ask members, are they uh, in agreement of the minutes as drafted? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Agenda item four is matters arising. Members, you've been provided at page 99 with a response from Solace to queries on what councils are doing to ensure vulnerable people are aware of the COVID-19 um, funding support. Um, just before I ask any comments, I, my understanding of that... Oh, bit of background noise. My understanding of... Um, what members were, were wanting to find out was actually what was happening in specific councils because, because not every council is rolling out the same schemes when it comes to the, the warmth and uh, the food and, and all of those other necessary things. They've been given money by the department and they've been allowed to roll out their own schemes. I think if members are in agreement, I would like to write back to Solace and ask them if they could just detail on a council level. Um, how they're progressing that because I think the point was made by one, I think it was Mark maybe or, or Andy had said, you know, people see things on social media of what a council is doing and then they realize they think that it's the same in their own council and you find out it isn't. So members be happy enough that if we write back to Solace and ask just if they could just be a bit more detailed on what each council is doing. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, Andy, you want to come yeah, in? No, absolutely, Chair. And, and again, I think one of the points that we made was about getting more detail on some of those programmes, the Warm, Well and Connected, for example, and I think the Advice NI Heating Grant, um, just so that we as members of the committee, and we can disseminate that down amongst um, our offices, etc., to make sure that those who can avail of this are able to do so, because not everybody's on social media, for example, and that's where I see most of the inf information being available. Okay. No, we can ask for that. Are members in agreement with that then? Can we move on? Agreed. Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Members then, you've been provided at page 101 with a ministerial response um, to queries on community transport. The minister states that she would be happy to meet with Minister Mallon and other executive colleagues to discuss the issues facing the community transport sector. Can I ask members, are they content to note or any comments? Content to note? Good, okay. Then we'll move on then to page 102, uh, where there's a departmental response to queries on the concordant agreement with the voluntary community sector. The, mem the minister has committed to renew the relationship with the sector, and it is anticipated that the concordant will be revisited and refreshed in line with the ambition of the new programme for government and as part of a strategic recovery and renewal agenda for the sector. Can I ask then again, members, any comments? Are they content to note? Kelly? Kelly? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a wee bit concerned about that um, response. Um, the Concordat Agreement is a significant agreement with the community and voluntary sector. For instance, it includes criteria such as no volunteer can be compelled um, to replace an employee, um, and, and it's quite detailed. The sector have been having meetings with, with um, you know, the department. Um, it would be useful to get an, a readout and an update of that. It, I think at this stage, that as a scrutiny committee, that we should be keeping an eye on that because... Um, it's just I'm, I'm I'm very aware of the very good work that our community and voluntary sector do, and we want to ensure that the commitments that are contained within the Concordat are as good for the community and voluntary sector as they would be for government. Um, so it would be useful to get an update. Um, I don't know whether if the department don't want to do that, even if we at some stage had a briefing, maybe in, in, in safer times, um, from the community and voluntary sector stakeholder partners that are taking part in that debate. On the con or the discussions on the concordat, we could ask Kelly if you want. We could ask them to, to give us a um, a written briefing firstly, and then take a look at that and move forward. Would that be happy with that? Yes, yeah, so much safer at this time, Chair. Thank you. Okay. All right. Members agree with that? Yes. The way forward on mm -hmm. that one. Yep. Okay. Then can I ask members then to turn to page one hundred and three? 
of their meeting packs where there's a departmental response to queries on sports organisations that have lost income during the COVID period um, with regard to providing support to losses relating to hospitality. Um, the application form for the fund provided for clubs to include information relating to income and expenditure from their social club bars and food provision. However, a separately constituted social club would not be eligible in its own right um, to this scheme. Members, that this is something that has been rumbling on now for a number of weeks, and I, I know that um, I, and I advise members last week, and some members were on the APG on, on sports, that uh, Sport NI had said that there will be uh, clubs that will be entitled to that source of funding and they're happy with that but we know that there will be excluded can I just ask then I don't know if we've, we've done it or not but just to revisit the idea of writing to the finance minister just to ask him that those clubs that are excluded from the sports uh, excuse me from the sports suppose it, sustainability funding and um, that uh, are picked up by the Department of Finance so can we get agreement that we write to the finance minister and I yeah, okay. sure. Absolutely, um, and, and I think if I recall um, in a question uh, asked by my colleague John Stewart in relation to this, um, the Finance Minister indicated that he was, was perhaps aware that this fund was undersubscribed. Um, if possible, I know it might be early days, but if we can get some more information regarding that, because I know we as a committee have heard the scale of the impact across the sports sector, uh, and I'd be certainly surprised that it was undersubscribed, given the impact right across the sports sector, um, but it'd be good to get a, a detailed information in respect to that. Yeah, and that fund that has now closed, yep. um, hasn't it? So therefore 20. the department should have that, that information available now, so yeah, we can also ask that as well for uh, some uh, written briefing on that also. Okay, members agreed. Um, happy enough then that we move on to our next agenda item, yes? Okay. We're going to move on then to agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on the budget 2021-22. Members, you'll find this at page 106 of your meeting pack. And can I welcome to the meeting Gavin Patrick and Cherry Arnold. Um, I know they were here with us last week and members did get an opportunity to ask some questions but we maybe want to just uh, ask a few more. I had finished last week um, with Andy and Alex still had to ask questions. I'm going to go to Alex first and then I'm going to come back to Andy and see if he has anything further. Any other members can they please just indicate um, if they want to ask any further questions. So, uh, oh, I've lost my screen here a moment. There we're back. Alex, then can I ask you then if you have any questions? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. can indeed, Alex. Okay, I'm all excited. This is the first time I've used this. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I'm concerned about the budget. Obviously, there's a, a shortfall in the budget. Um, I'm wondering how that's going to impact on community groups who rely on the Lexus Sport, neighbourhood renewal and areas at risk. Can you give us an update on what you're planning with those budgets and are they being looked at to be cut or stopped or what's happening with those? Um, well, if, if I answer that one, Chair, um, the, the Minister has um, protected the, the, the neighbourhood renewal uh, budget. So although the position currently is a draft budget and still out for consultation, that, that is uh, mm -hmm. the just in position. Okay, what about spot and areas at risk? And, and the same same applies to those as well. The, those are protected areas for, um, for the minister. So um, uh, again, while it's a draft position, that uh, that's a, the outline position by the minister. Okay, well that's that's a wee bit of good news. Um, in regards to it's probably more capital. Um, um, is, is there going to be any cuts in terms of funding to help take forward new social housing? Um, where's that? And um, for the social housing um, budget, again, it's a priority for the minister, um, and the the targets um, are looking to increase the number of units being being built next year. So rather than the cut, where um, the department's actually seeking to to increase the number of units being built, um, are taken forward in in, in twenty one twenty two. Okay, that's positive as well. Um, didn't you touch last week on? Cutting funding for Invest NI, didn't we? Yeah. On um, sorry, on Invest NI. Yeah, and cutting funding for Invest NI. No. Um, so um, we we don't. That's the Department for Economy, so we don't um, fund um, Invest NI. Right, you don't at all. Right, okay. 
Okay. Not, not, um, not directly. I've been an NDPB of, 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 um, of the Department for Economy. There may be some funding streams um, that may through um, flow through, such as, um, but I've not. we're not the main funder for investing. You're not the main one? Okay. Um, well, I was going to say, what meetings has the Minister had with uh, the Finance Minister to try and address the shortfall that's been forecast? Uh, there's been a number of interactions right from the start of the of the budget gathering exercise back in September, um, and there's been a number of bilaterals both um, in the autumn time and and also since uh, Christmas there's been uh, at, at least uh, two two budget bilaterals where um, the department's position has, has been outlined. The finance minister, uh, especially those points that are raised in the EKIA. Um, around um, that have uh, the potential impact uh, as set out in there and the, on the welfare staffing, um, the labour market interventions and the, um, the advice sector funding. Okay. Is there any indications from the finance department that will be extra money fine for, for, for the budget or? Well, yeah. I, I, as I say, it's a draft budget, so it's out for consultation. So uh, um, I suppose all, all input is being received by the Department for Finance. Um, and, and then the executive will make further decisions on once once a consultation uh, period uh, closes. Okay. Okay. That's me for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Can I just ask supplementary on Alex about the the budget for housing? That budget for housing is it? Does that include the supporting people budget, or is it a separate budget? It's a separate budget, so the social housing is a capital budget, and the supporting people uh, uh, would be. Uh, it's uh, the resource budget. Okay, and what, where is the supporting people budget then? What's um, is it? Has it had any increase? Um, well, again, supporting people has been a protected area in the past few years, and, and the ministers um, uh, 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 holding the same session on that again. So, although no final decisions have been made, it has been protected. Yeah, albeit it's been protected, but it hasn't received any um, real-time increase in I don't no, know how many years. No. So protected is no. you know it's still not good enough, and um, we know that the, no, the service they provide. Uh, we we did make uh, further bids for, for that in this exercise, but uh, those bids weren't met um, in the draft budget. Okay, but I mean, I I, I I know the minister would be very much aware of the, of supporting people and very much in support of supporting people. So I'd imagine that she will continue then um, to be asking for further bids to, to try and, and meet those increases um, within supporting people. I would imagine she was had conversations around that as well. Uh, again, with, with all of our, our bids and, and those uh, bilateral meetings with the finance minister, all, all of our bids were discussed. Um, obviously, there's a prioritisation, and, and, and when we look at the AQIA, those were the, 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 the immediate ones that were highlighted, as I previously mentioned, but all, all bids are, are being um, put forward by, by the minister and have been, uh, and pushed on, on highlighting the, the issues in the different sectors. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to then, I've got uh, Andy, then Sinead, then Robin, then Kelly. So, Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Gavin. A couple of questions, Gavin, I'll, I'll go through these uh, in order. The Coming back to the universal credit um, issue that was raised by committee colleagues last week, uh, and you'd highlighted, I think, was in the round a requirement of 900 to 1,200 staff. What, what sort of figures on that? Obviously, that, this would cause a great deal of concern, given that universal credit is now going to be moving forward and, and previously is the, the main uh, social security benefit. Uh, replacing all the legacy benefits, and it, it's a major concern if we're going to see any increase in the waiting time for people to be paid. I have huge difficulty with the five-week wait, even at that. I know the department in previous questions that I've asked has highlighted that they're processing claims much faster, but this causes me real concern, as do other areas. Um, good morning, Andy. Um, I'll take that one. Um, in terms of universal credit, we submitted a bid for 900 staff. That The, the total for a bid was 31.7 million. At this point in time, we would need around about 1,200 staff to deliver our current universal credit caseload. The bid that we submitted, um, obviously it would be a challenge for the department at this time to bring in 900 staff to train them, recruit them, accommodate them and equip them with IT, especially too as we have ongoing social distancing measures in place. 
So we bid for we bid to the Department of Finance for the nine hundred um, as part of the the budget exercise. Again, as you're aware, that bid has not been met. However, we did um, caveat that at the time with the fact that we would go back in year if we required additional staffing, and we would also to to seek to deliver efficiencies within the service as we delivered it. So you are correct; it, it will be really challenging for us. It's really disappointing that our bid hasn't been met, and as Gavin mentioned earlier. Uh, Minister continues to engage finance minister. We continue to engage our Department of Finance colleagues. Um, and obviously, this is subject at the minute to public consultation. So we'll obviously see the outcomes of that. But we would hope we'll, we would get we would be hopeful that we would get an allocation that we do not see an impact on our benefit delivery side of the, of the business. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and should should we be in a situation whereby uh, there is no allocation for additional staff? What other contingencies are there? What What's the department exploring in that respect? Um, well, at the minute, and, and what, what in terms of what we're doing, we're looking right across the department at vacancies um, and potentially how we can <coughs> excuse me, deliver efficiencies, uh, both um, across our programmes, across the department, across our ILBs. However, Anything we deliver will not be sufficient to meet the requirement that we have. So it will mean that in the absence of funding, that our payment timeframes could be impacted. I know last week I mentioned that five week could slip out to six or seven weeks. We could also t- see to um, uh, performance in terms of that we're, we're currently delivering around about 96% uh, of payments on time within that five week window. We could see that slip to around 80, 85%. Um, we will have to continue delivering a contingency service, but there will be significant impacts in the absence of funding. Okay, and, and, and has there been any scenarios run in relation to the amount of staff? So you're saying 900, if, if there was fu- funding found for 400 staff, obviously that, has there been any contingencies as to the impact run? Um, we, we've looked at that um, in terms of what we could do, but largely it would be still delivering a contingency service. As I mentioned at the minute, we would need around around about 1,200. And as we see furlough end, we're likely to see further job losses and further increases in our caseload. Like in a period of 10 months, we've seen our universal credit caseload increase 126%. So there is significant concerns in terms of our ability to manage and deliver a service without additional funding. Okay. And just in respect of the... I know colleagues made comments as well around the independent advice sector, and I've seen positive comments from the Minister in respect to this, and I know it's an area right across the board that is valued uh, and, and is very much needed. Where, where are we with that? Is, is there any further movement on that? The, the 1.5? Um, ter- 1.8, is it? Yeah, in, in terms of independent advice, our Minister is very committed to supporting the advice sector, and we're currently looking and turning within the department on options on how we can meet that funding okay. requirement next year. And are you able to, able to elaborate on those uh, that advice you're given to finance? Uh, it, it, in terms of, it'll not be advice to finance, it'll be advice to our minister yep. in terms of what we can do. But at this point in time, we haven't got that allocation carved out yet. It's still under development, um, but our minister is really committed to continuing to support the advice sector and is obviously to continue to lobby with finance minister for additional funding for next year. Okay. Annie, um, can I ask a supplementary on that, just yeah. while you're on that subject, if you don't mind? Um, you'd said there about finding it within your own department. Um, that would be then, I would imagine, at the risk of maybe others within the voluntary and community sector. Um, and I don't think, I certainly don't think that Advice NI would be happy about that either. Um, I think that any the extra funding certainly for the advice sector needs to come from the, the, the finance minister and from the executive, because we already know that many projects are going to suffer. It was one of the first questions I asked you last week around all of those other groups that are funded. Um, so I, I, I just I don't see where the, the minister can find the money within her, her own department. It's going to have to come. Um, from beyond the department, um, I just wanted to make that point. Um, can I just, before yeah. bring Andy back in, or if, sh- if Sherry wants to come back in, Gavin has dropped out of our spotlight, so can I ask that Gavin Patrick be brought back into the spotlight again? Okay, sorry, Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. Sorry, apologies. Uh, you're okay, you're okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if, can we jump to resource bids in respect of the regional and sub-regional? Where, where does that leave those two programmes, the, the 0.7 million that, that has been unallocated? 
will, will they uh, be able to be progressed without that resource? Um, if, I, if I pick that one up, Ali, um, obviously, again, um, those are uh, priorities for, for the Minister and the Executive under NDNA. So, um, similar to uh, the discussion that's just been had there on the advice sector, we are looking at options within the department and able to, to take those um, uh, areas forward. Um, but uh, as, as it is, it is still a draft budget, so um, we are still still pursuing uh, um, funding for those uh, centres from the Department of Finance. Okay, okay. But if, if that's not met, I would imagine, um, unless it's able to be met again within the department, and there's a huge pressure on the department right across the board, I'm sure people will be able to point to various different areas they have concern with. Um, where, where does that leave those programmes? Well, obviously, as, as our overall budget, we, we, we are going to have to put proposals to the Minister um, of prioritisation of the budget. Uh, uh, so those programmes, as I say, are, are, are a priority um, for both the Minister and the Executive as a whole. So um, that, that will uh, be reflected in the prioritisation of, of, of our proposals um, to the Minister. Okay, and, and, and I know it's not contained within the, the draft budget as, as drafted, but there is some speculation around, um, given obviously casement, uh, there's an uplift uh, being forecast for casement, given um, you know, costs increasing and, and so forth so on. Has there been any consideration around sub-regional, where, where we are with that? Because obviously, if the picture's true for casement, being the, the, the cost increasing, I would imagine that being the same for sub-regional stadia, where, where are we with that? Are we suddenly going to get blindsided with a huge increase as well? Um, well, I'm aware that work's ongoing on the sub-regional and there's consultation ongoing. So, um, and the, the work is aiming to ensure the programme reflects the, the needs of, of, of local football. So, um, once that full analysis is done, then um, that detail and proposals will be brought to the Minister. Um, and if if there's any changes in, in funding requirements, then that, that would, would be brought uh, further to, to the executive. But at this stage, it's, um, the, the, it's research and consultation being carried out, so there, there's no indication, no clear indication of, of the funding um, requirements or, uh, at, at this point. Okay. Um, two, two final points. Um, the £2 million pounds for uh, mitigations in respect. All the mitigations are important. Um, and obviously, we'd like to see as many as those taken forward. But just, just for now, if we can, the two million in relation to the special rule for terminal illness. Where are we with that since we last spoke? Has there been any further development? Is the minister looking to find that within her, her current budget? Or I also think I've seen some mention around alternative contingencies. Is there anything else on the table in respect of progressing the, the cross-party um, support for um, a movement in this area? Uh, yes, yeah, so obviously the two million requirement was a bid for six months. Obviously it would take a period of time next year to put the legislation in place. The full year requirement is actually four million pound in future years. Um, Minister is fully committed, as, as I mentioned last week, to bringing forward um, proposals to change the, the six month criteria, to move that out to 12 months. Um, obviously our bid was not met in the draft budget allocation. Um, Minister continues again uh, to lobby finance minister for the additional support required. We are, as a department, obviously to, in the absence of any executive funding, considering how we can meet that pressure, um, that will be extremely challenging given our overall budget position for next year. Um, um, we are hopeful of a further allocation in the final budget. Um, this has formed part of the discussions through the bilaterals with finance minister. Okay, and, and where are we with DWP? Has there been any further engagement with them in respect of a UK-wide policy on this? Um... Yes, um, well, there, there's regular engagement with DWP on this issue. Um, DWP, as I understand, the time frame there has slipped. They're still hoping to progress this. Um, our, but obviously, however, our minister was keen to progress ahead of DWP on this issue. Okay. Okay. So they're they're keen to progress it. Any timelines on, on that? Uh, when when they're likely to progress? No, we. No, we've no we've no visibility on timeframes. Okay. Okay. Um, we could probably go on all day, but I will I will let colleagues come in. Sure, I'll, I'll finish in this final point. Um, housing transformation, obviously, flagship announcement from um 
the, the minister's predecessor, uh, Carl, uh, in respect of the Howden executive, were, were if, if this allocation of 3.1 million resource uh, is not met, where does that leave that program? I know you in your briefing note here you'd said it would obviously um, you know put it under significant pressure in terms of delay. How much of that could be taken forward in absence of the 3.1 million uh, allocation? Uh, and if I if I need to take that one, uh, it's similar answers to the, the previous ones on this, and that we, we need to, to look um, across our, our budget and prioritise uh, accordingly. Um, clearly, uh, as has been a minister announcement on this a priority, but will need to be set against uh, the other competing priorities within the department. Um, and, and that work is ongoing. Um, and, and again, it is a draft budget, and we, and we still do. Uh, pursue additional funding for this um, from DOF and, and the executive as part of the final outcome of the budget. Okay, and just, just finally, a um, number of times you would mentioned about looking at considerations around meeting the, the cost in, in, within the, the context of DFC's budget. Can you just uh, lay out the total uh, amount of unallocated resource that was bid for that, that has not been allocated? What, what are we looking at? Um, so our... Uh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Um, in, in terms of our resource bids for the 21 22 financial year, they totaled £318 million, pounds, um, and of them, only £42.8 million was met for existing mitigations. Sorry, I, I didn't catch that there. So, how, how much uh, was unmet in total across the, the resource budget? Uh, around about 280 million. Okay, okay. So significant pressures. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay, thanks, Andy. It's just to remind members also that the Minister is in next week um, for a 9 a.m. slot to discuss the sub regional stadia programme. So it's just to just remind members of that also. Okay, then I have then Sinead, Robin, and then Kelly. So, Sinead? for a briefing on regional and sub-regional next week. Um, I just don't think it's appropriate for us to be speculating about a project that has no final business case yet um, and linking it just to other projects is, is not the way to go in my opinion. But listen, I'm not going to rehash my comments from last week uh, in terms of why we're in the situation um, and the problems with the budget. But um, I do want to put on record and recognise the Minister's efforts in terms of, of advice and that is that is entirely welcome. Um, the mechanics of that, uh, as you alluded to, Chair, will have to be worked out, but, uh, but I'm sure um, we'll hear more about that in the next few weeks. Um, Chair, really I just wanted to, to reiterate my proposal from last week. Um, I made a proposal at the, at the end of our budget briefing last week, and um, I know other members want to make comment, but I'd just like to, to remind you of that and just to say that that proposal still stands, and if we could maybe action that just whenever everyone's had a chance to make their comments. Um, do you want to just remind us, Sinead, what the proposal was for everybody? Yeah, it was because I know the minister has written, obviously, we've, we've spoke about it um, numerous times last week and this week to the finance minister in terms of the precarious position that we are uh, with the budget. Um, and my proposal was that this committee support her in that and we equally write to the Department for Finance um, just to echo it and support her calls for additional funding for this draft budget. Yep, absolutely. I would be in 100% agreement with that, so would, and I'm sure all members are. If any members aren't in agreement, they can certainly let us know. But, yeah, no, thank you, Sinead. Have you any further questions you want to ask or just wanted to get that, put that point no, out? No, I just wanted to say, no. just put that back on the, on the car. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Um, I'll go on to move to Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and welcome the, 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 the members to the committee this morning. Thank you. Um, can I just... Uh, just two simple uh, questions, and Andy has taken up one of my questions around the <coughs> NIHE, so we'll not go there. Um, in terms of the housing for all Fresh Start Shared Social Housing, it has a budget uh, which in 2022-23 dips, then increases, and then increases more significantly. Um, can I ask you, what, why, why, sorry, the budget uh, dips and increases, but the housing for all remains static across the, 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 the budget period. Why, why is that? Um, well, first, our funding, specific funding, uh, 
uh, is coming in from the from the executive. Um, so obviously, if we get that specific funding, that is allocated. Um, I didn't quite catch because the connection that she or she were referring to, but um, okay. I sorry, I was looking on, under under the under the budget line, housing dash new build. Uh, 2021-22 figure dips in 2022-23, then increases at 20, oh. and then increases. Okay, sorry, but but the yeah. fresh start budget remains static. Yeah. So uh, there's two different elements in there. So the, the, the fresh start funding is, is is specific funding coming in from executive, and then we have our own. Uh, the, the, the proposed capital um, bids that we have put in. The, the reason for the, the fluctuation in the, in the budget um, is the profiling of the the, um, the, the build and the, the timing of those going through. So even though the budget is fluctuating, the target build of units is planned to increase over those years. So um, it's, it's really a timing issue of, of spend, but it doesn't impact the number of units being uh, being built. In fact, we, like I say, we're looking to increase the, the number of units each year. Yeah. And, and the, the, the units will still be built right up to 2024-25 by housing associations? Um, so the housing associations, that's the co-ownership funding. So, um, but uh, yeah, part, part of that 163 the, the new build line is the social housing uh, development program. So it's within within that um, funding stream. Um, so the, the target is still building from 1,850 this year to 1,900 uh, next year units and then increasing each year after that and moving moving forward. Um, assuming obviously those are our bids for funding, assuming those bids are met in future years. And at this point, we only focus, we only have the, the draft budget for the 21-22 year. G given the housing need, it's not overly ambitious. Well, I think, like I say, the, 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 the department I know is, is pushing on this to increase the, the number of units each year. So there, there is a, a push to, to increase. It is remaining static, albeit the... I, um, I accept that. I'm just saying it's not overly okay. ambitious. Given the housing need. Well, like I say, we're working with the housing executive and the housing associations who carry out the, the, the new build to to push as far as possible to meet that need and it's recognised um, that there is a significant need there. Um, hence uh, the, the funding um, being prioritised to, to that the capital funding being prioritised to that area. Okay, thank you. Can I just raise with you in, in the areas of um, housing, that's O3, other programmes, affordable warmth, boiler replacement um, areas. One of the big complaints I get is that um, the housing executive homes that are um, uh, built by the housing executive are now in a situation where heat retention, energy conservation, is a serious problem. And as I understand it, there is no standard set for public sector homes to meet in terms of energy conservation. Should we not be seeing a budget line in there for, uh, along with affordable warmth and boiler replacement scheme, for energy conservation issues? Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to, to refer that to, to my policy colleagues um, on that and, and how that, that is dealt with within their schemes and the, and the regulations that are held to. Um, I don't have the answer with me at, at this point, um, but we, we could come back to you on that. Uh, I, I'd be grateful, Chair, because I, mean, I think basically uh, every week, People are looking for replacement doors. People are looking for replacement windows. People are complaining about energy conservation. Uh, they're spending on budgets, and, and particularly those on the lower incomes. Um, and I would have thought that as we look to the future of homes, we should be looking to 
address the issue of, of energy conservation. I think it's a green issue, Chair, uh, an environmental issue, uh, and it's an economic issue as well. Okay, I mean, I'm happy enough that we also do that as well as a committee. I'm grateful, if Gavin, if you could get that information or pass that information yes, on, I'll rather. Back. Yeah. I will do. I will do. Thank you, Gavin. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I have Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Gavin and Cherry. Um, I, I did ask you questions last week. This week, it's just tightening down on a few bits and pieces. Um, there's obviously a very substantial and ambitious housing target, and we all support that with the Minister, absolutely. I have a little bit of a concern, and Chair, it, it might be for the committee to write on this one. Um, I've been asking questions of infrastructure, Department of Infrastructure, because housing targets will be um, massively affected by um, the ability for Northern Ireland Water to improve wastewater treatment works um, to enable those housing targets to be met. I'm just wondering, um, there doesn't appear to be any caveat within the current draft budget um, if those housing targets cannot be met because of other outside forces, like for instance, what's under the ground, the sewage systems not being um, or not having capacity or being in place to allow that development to happen. Is there any sort of build in within your financial thinking on that that just isn't within these documents? Well, those considerations I know are, are made when, when we're looking at the targets um, and, uh, and we, we obviously work with colleagues with, within um, the, the DFI um, uh, as to those. They, they are a risk. Uh, there's risks around uh, all, the, all these targets, so um, I suppose they, they, they're taken account of. But uh, and again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it is a priority um, to, to roll out like the social housing, so there's a risk around I suppose any capital build and potential delays, but we are pushing ahead where we can on on, the, on, on increasing our targets. I should say. Okay, no, I'm, just, I'm sort of I'm a bit worried because I have been asking questions, you know, about um, infrastructure marrying up um, where where there's gaps in wastewater treatment to where there's housing need. Um, I'm talking to the department about that. I'm just concerned there may be a lot of money that goes back. The other one I just wanted clarification again on housing is the homelessness money. Um, sorry, it's on, uh, I think it's, oh, where is it here? Um, it's early on in your figures. It's, it's um, for us, at the top of page 108, um, at number three on your table. There doesn't seem to be any housing allocation money for this year or the coming financial year, but there is in future years for, for it says homelessness housing first. Um, is that because there's a COVID um, money that's separate to that? Or, or you know, there's, why is there no allocation this year or this coming year? Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd need to go back and check that one. It's obviously, and I, I, I see there in the profile, it's a forecast for 22, 23, and 23, 24. So um, I, I assume it's a, it's, a, it's a specific need in that, but I would need to just go back and double check. Um, right. I'll focus at the moment, there's obviously in, in 21, 22, as, as I say, while we provided that information in 22, 23 onwards, we only have the one year capital. Budget, albeit it's in capital, it's wise to profile ahead as far as possible because it's, it's a long term. I appreciate that. No, absolutely. Um, the the just I have a couple more. Um, as you have very kindly have admitted, and 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 we all recognise the pressures that will be under the department and um, the universal credit payment. And you you have highlighted that there could be delays in getting um, that money out to people if. If the recruitment um, of of the staff, you know, doesn't happen, so we absolutely appreciate that that could be out of your hands. But I'm just looking at the discretionary support budget; it's flatlined across the project projected years. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as we've seen this year, discretionary budget, um, you know, has been handed or will be handed back. Um, I'm just wondering. You know, it's just flatline. I'm. If we're expecting such an increase in the number of people coming forward for universal credit, and we would rather that. Well, I know from a constituency basis, rather that people had discretionary support rather than having to go for the advance loans. Um, is is there any bids? Do you know of going forward to uplift that figure for the first couple of years or the first year anyway of our, our draft budget? 
So you, you'll see the figure for the loans on the capital table. Um, obviously, loans are offset with recovery. So our, our overall capital budget for that is $2.7 million each year. We sustain that loan scheme with recoveries of loans. But in addition to that, we do have our own resource budget for discretionary support. So we have $13.2 million for that. And that um, will sustain that scheme, uh, obviously, for in, the, in the next financial year. Um, I'm just wondering if, it, if it's flatlined, should it not be upweighted knowing what we know um, or are expecting for this year coming forward? We we haven't upped that um, flatline budget at the minute, that um, $13.72 million that's available for the grants, um, because in previous years that was actually underspent. So we are actually, our, our prediction at the minute is that $13.72 million will be fully spent next year. And we obviously will take a consideration then in year whether or not we can top it up internally or whether or not we bid in an in-year monitoring round. But for, for the budget exercise, the decision was taken to hold it flat. Okay. Um, I'm just checking to say, obviously, we haven't seen yet the Minister's plans for welfare reform um, or welfare mitigations. Sorry. Um, I know that, that we as a committee have been concerned that the number of or the underspend on the discretionary, you know, um, support that's provided. Can I just check with you, the advance loans, is that paid directly by DWP or is that from within Northern Ireland's block grant? And the same with the contingency fund, is that something that we have separately in Northern Ireland? Um, I'm just wondering where the money comes from on that um, because we find that the loans, we love them to be um, looked at because they are put in, we've heard from different stakeholders that they do cause difficulties for people putting them in debt. Um, and, uh, you know, a discretionary provision, a grant would be much more preferable. So I'm just wondering, is the, are the loans um, from DWP and conti or contingency or discretionary support from ourselves? Advances are, are on your AME spend, so that is tre a treasury spend. And contingency from then, okay. obviously, it's Northern Ireland block grant. So we do we do have a, a, a budget for that. Okay. No, thank you very much. I appreciate. I know I asked a lot the last time as well, but um, not an easy time, not an easy budget. Here's hoping the negotiations go well for the minister and, and we get a lot more money. And I absolutely support Sinead's comment earlier that we should be writing to um, the finance minister, support our minister um, and the endeavours. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I, our computer screen here has gone a bit silly, so um, I don't know if Karen or Mark want to come in, but um, um, somebody's coming down to fix that. So I'm just going to ask Mark first, if we bring Mark in. Mark, have you any questions? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Gavin and Tree. No, I asked quite a few last week as well, but just to thank the, the, the guys for coming back again to answer more this week. And it's just one uh, I've been going through this for the papers while they've been chatting there and answering other questions from members. It's, it's on the capital bids and to do with city deals. I don't know if you guys will have any detail on this or not. But uh, I was just wondering in terms of the, the, the detail of, of the money for those bids. I mean, there's £8 million going for the Belfast Region City Deal next year are proposed and £500,000 for their in Strabane. So they did, are they attached to specific projects or is that making up a percentage of the whole package or, or, or what way is that from? So um, the Sydney deal, those were, were estimates um, at the time in, uh, at, in September when we uh, provided the data for the information gathering exercise um, of both both the, of the projects being taken forward in both those Sydney deals. Obviously, there's, a, there's quite a difference between the amounts in there, but the, the Belfast region deal is, is much further ahead than the, the, the Darien Strabane Sydney deal. Um, my understanding, as we're now looking through uh, and, and looking to profile our, our draft allocation against those beds, is that the, the need there will be much less than, than, than we originally indicated in 21 22, as the Sydney deals haven't quite progressed. The business cases haven't quite progressed at, at the speed as we had hoped back in September. Um, so th th those were high level estimates at, at that point in time, um, and we'll be developing those further as as um, as the, the weeks and, and the year goes ahead. And, and, and elsewhere, you, know, you said that, that you expect or anticipate that those will come down you know, through the course of, of the year. Is there anywhere else you see that happening? Under, under other 
headlines where money might become available and what scope is there then to reprofile capital? So we, um, so as I say, we provide those estimates at the time and the, the, the bid there is 329 million and our draft allocation is 224 million. Um, so we're now working through a prioritisation exercise, uh, really looking at, at, at all the figure work um, uh, to ensure that uh, we're updating the estimates that we had done previously and then seeking to prioritise uh, those um, to allow the Minister to make a decision on, on the capital uh, spend in next year. So uh, at this point, we're, we're looking at, at all the lines. Not having said that, we've already discussed the SHDP and it's a priority for the Minister, and that, and that still remains the same, which is a, which is a, a, a large bulk of the, the funding that goes out through the housing. Okay, thanks, Helen. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, Karen, I'm going to ask you, if you I'm not bouncing you because I know you're only brand new into the committee first time this week. I just want to, just because our computer system was down there, just if you have anything you want to add further, are you happy enough that we, we, we move on? No, Paul, I, I did want to come on. Thank okay. you, uh, Chair. Just I suppose, listen um, uh, there to the discussion, it further highlights um, uh, the pressures that we have here in relation to yearly budgets without the ability to carry over. And just to suppose following on from particularly Kelly's comments around um, the water, uh, NA water um, and waste treatment plants. Here in my own city, uh, I suppose one of the areas where the majority of the social housing that is being built um, very much depends on a new pump station. And uh, so regardless of the housing funding allocated um, and the demands that's there that, that needs to be met, we need to see um, uh, that close working with the Department of, of Infrastructure in relation to it because we can't see that that uh, be stopped. So just wanted, I suppose, in terms of Kelly's point, it was well made. Uh, I know those discussions are ongoing, um, but when we need so much social housing, we're working on a tight budget particularly um, in areas like my own constituency. I don't want to see any money being handed back or development stopped. Thank you, Gavin and uh, Chair, for the update. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Karen. Um, OK, any comment on that from Gavin or, or Terry? Are we... Well, I'll, I'll feed that back to the team. Like I say, I, I, I believe that is a risk that is considered in, in, in all developments and planning, but I'll, I'll feed back that especially the, the housing team just to make sure that uh, they're taken into account. Okay. All right. Thank you. And thank you, Karen. Um, any other members want to ask anything before we stop this briefing session? No, that's okay. Um, look, can I thank both of you for coming back again this week? I really do appreciate it and for taking um, all of our questions and answers and for also um, advising us that you will go back to your various units within the department to get us some more information. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. then also just remind members then that um, Sinead had a proposal on the table. So we're all members in agreement um, to that proposal as well that we, we write to the finance minister, certainly in support of our own minister. Um, for that extra funding that we made available. Yeah, okay. All right, Great. members. Thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to just take a very short um, stop here while we prepare for our next witness. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, um, just before I move on to our next um, witness session, before moving on to agenda item 6, um, just to remind members that the uh, committee clerks will bring back a draft response to the Finance Committee on the Budget um, uh, at next week's meeting for our consideration. So, members, happy enough with that? Okay. All right, members, and then just before we move into our, our evidence sessions on licensing bill, I just want to take the opportunity um, just to highlight the information released by NISRA yesterday. Um, I don't know if members had a chance to read over that or heard even um, it was on um, GMU this morning as well um, about the, the figures in Northern Ireland of alcoholic-specific deaths and the, the increase, um, and that 2019 was the highest on record with over a third more that was recorded 10 years ago and also the, the massive increase in the amount of deaths amongst females um, that were alcohol related. So it's just to maybe just say to members, if you haven't had a chance to look at that NISRA report, it's maybe worthwhile having a look at that as well, um, especially as we're, we're considering the, the licensing bill. Um, so members of the corner, then just move on to agenda item six then, which is a briefing by the Presbyterian and Methodist churches, and they're going to brief us on the licensing and registration of clubs. You'll find that at page 130 of your meeting pack, and can I welcome to the meeting Karen Jardine, um, the Reverend David Clements, and Lindsay Conway. Lindsay, I understand that you're going to make some opening remarks. Yes, Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, first of all, just to... we. Welcome the opportunity to, to make this verbal presentation to the committee, uh, and hopefully you find the written submission from the Presbyterian Church uh, helpful uh, and of use to the committee. I will speak uh, and highlight a few areas of the bill, and Karen will follow, and then David will, will close. First of all, I want to acknowledge the importance of the bill. We are responding not only as a denomination, but also as a service provider. Uh, the Presbyterian Council for Social Witness, as some of you will know, manages Carlisle House and Addiction Centre in Belfast, funded by the Belfast Trust and the Northern Trust. And added to that, pastorally, all churches are dealing with the daily issues related to alcohol misuse. Chair, we are disappointed that the bill goes much further than the 2016 bill in respect of Good Friday and Easter Day. During our previous submission, we acknowledged that the modest change was needed, and I recall that we were commended for our approach to that proposed change. PCI would like to place on record that Easter remains a significant and an important time for many 
in our denomination and those of none across Northern Ireland who, who really register Easter time as a time for rest and reflection. We would also ask that consideration be given to the introduction of the protection of workers, and Karen will say more about that, who choose not to work on Good Friday or, or Easter Day as they observe their religious uh, uh, rights and all of that, ensuring that they have the ability to attend public worship and other activities. Chair, sure, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, uh, the problem of alcohol misuse just never goes away and sadly increases uh, year on, year out. Traditionally, churches have had few allies in this whole area in the past, very much associated with the anti-drink lobby. Over the years, the situation has greatly changed and over recent times, with clear concerns coming from the health service, with alcohol-related diseases, from the Department of Justice with regards to related crime. And to quote directly from our submission, these effects are well documented in previous public discussions about alcohol licensing. The church has found common voice with health and social care professionals, many of whom were at meeting the strain placed on accident and emergency units and other public services. And with police officers who see at first hand the results of drink driving, domestic violence, and other forms of alcohol, alcohol abuse. It is clear to us that the public health, community safety, and well being of individuals and families should be the primary concern of all public policy making, especially in connection with alcohol. PCI welcomes the various measures set out that are designed to protect children and young people whilst addressing the excessive consumption of alcohol. Specifically, PCI welcomes the role of the courts in all of that and, and giving some, some limits to, to, those, um, to those opening hours with important um, really acknowledging the places that, that children can safely drink. Chair, I plead to the committee is to consider seriously all the other issues that we have raised in our in our written submission, the late opening hours, the drinking up times, the home deliveries, all of those things impact upon this piece of legislation. I recall the last submission that we made paid particular attention to home deliveries and the risk of young people in particular were uh, was just taking the delivery at the door without identity being checked. Also the fact that uh, we have um, a different approach now with regards to um, family outings and, and with regards to how children integrate within uh, within other facilities, and greater uh, greater um, caution should be should be given to all of that. So that's all I want to highlight in my opening remarks, and I, and I hand over to Karen. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today on on these issues. Um, I'd like to focus on two aspects, one of them Lindsay has already um, referred to, and the first is the potential impact of the changes in the licensing regime on staff who work in licensed premises and the duty of care um, of employers. Um, so initially in relation to the, the longer hours and the impact that that might have on staff safety and wellbeing, not only at their place of work, but also as they um, travel home from work and um, in the early hours of the morning and um, it might be that the committee might want to consider some sort of um, obligation around duty of care from employers um, in this regard. Also then um, just reflecting what Lindsay had said around the Easter period, um, perhaps protections could be provided to allow um, those um, people who work in the hospitality sector but wish to observe Good Friday, Easter Sunday the opportunity to opt out of working for those days. Um, legislation currently exists to allow retail staff to opt out of Sunday working where they wish to do so. And I suppose there's mechanisms in place there that could be used as a model. And I believe that um, the evidence that you received from Unite the Union also um, raised some of those issues. Um, the second aspect I'd just like to bring to the committee's attention 
is um, in relation to opportunities to review the impact of the legislation. This is um, quite a significant change to the licensing regime in Northern Ireland, um, the bill and, and how it may be amended going forward. And while undoubtedly there will be commercial and economic benefits for the hospitality sector, there will also be costs, as um, Lindsay has already alluded to, with regard to policing, criminal justice, health and social care. I think the previous estimate of costs um, in relation to alcohol misuse is 900 million, but that's from over 10 years ago. Those are figures from 2008, 2009. And so um, we don't really have anything um, more up to date than that to recognise what even a baseline might be at the minute. But a built-in review period, um, it might be one year or given um, the, the COVID situation, it might be two years, but it would help, I think, policymakers and legislators to have a better idea of what the impact um, is and um, the balance between what the costs might be of this legislation against the benefits as well. I'll hand over to David. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. And uh, again, just to uh, repeat the fact that we appreciate being able to um, present uh, to the committee. Uh, and I'm glad to be able to do it together with um, Presbyterian colleagues, um, not least because um, they have um, the resources, the time, and perhaps the intelligence um, to put this together better than the Methodists can. Um, I'll, I'll make just a brief comment about um, the Methodist um, Church and, and then uh, two or three points. Um, some of the overlap with uh, what Lindsay and Karen have said and uh, also uh, overlap with the, the, the Chair's opening comment, actually, which I think is very significant. Uh, the Methodist Church in Ireland has 156 congregations in Northern Ireland and our mission has always been to seek uh, God and uh, to seek God's blessing upon uh, church and society. Uh, we've sought to do this through our various ministries, which have included um, outreach to the poor and the marginalised, and uh, by a long and proud history of engagement with social uh, issues within society. Uh, the Methodist Church has got four uh, missions that operate within Northern Ireland, and a good deal of their time is spent with those who have problems arising from alcohol abuse, uh, and particularly with the families of uh, people where someone uh, is addicted to alcohol. And so with um, acceptance, compassion, guidance, help and prayer, uh, we offer these day on a daily basis. Um, and so uh, I think we have an interest uh, in this um, subject that comes from um, our ethos and our mission. Uh, Bethel's Church, I suppose, has a tradition of being um, against drink. Uh, indeed, someone once said the only thing they knew about the Methodists were that they were against drink. Uh, uh, that uh, perception, I think, probably um, was from a generation or two ago, um, and uh, our church has drifted, I guess, along with much of society uh, and other churches to some extent uh, in having a less, a less strict attitude perhaps, to, towards alcohol. Um, I myself, um, just for um, uh, addressing conflict of interest, if you like, uh, I'm, I'm teetotal. Um, I regret that none of my children are, my, my adult children now. Uh, in the previous um, presentation that we made uh, to the 1617 uh, dealing with this uh, business, uh, still stands or not, um, uh, our, our position hasn't changed. And as Lindsay said, when uh, uh, at that time there was some restrictions or some changes lifting of the, the uh, restrictions regarding Easter. Um, we recognized uh, that as something that was a compromise. Uh, I guess at this stage, um, we are sorry that um, that has, in this present legislation, been removed altogether. Um, clearly, uh, we're no longer a Christian country, uh, whether we ever were as a matter for debate, perhaps. Um, and we recognize that the role of the churches and Christians within society uh, is um, less than it was. Um, and yet it does seem to be a shame to me that, uh, that the, the most significant Christian uh, festival or season in the year uh, is, uh, is no longer given any um, place within uh, this kind of legislation. So we're sorry to see that, that, that go. Uh, our primary concern, I think, is uh, with uh, the welfare of the community. And we recognize uh, the, the harm that alcohol does. And uh, I was going to point out, but the chair has beaten me to it, um, the uh, statistics uh, issued from NITRA last week 
Um, I do think it's well worth uh, the Kennedy time to, I'm sure you've read it, um, but I would uh, commend you to reread um, the report that was done by, uh, I think it was Dr. Russell, a uh, briefing paper back in September for your committee uh, on um, alcohol, uh, dealing with uh, some of those um, uh, harm issues. Um, now, we recognize that uh, uh, the, the strong voices in this response will, will or many of them will, will come from the uh, from the drinks industry, also from the hospitality industry, and we recognize that particularly for the hospitality industry, for pubs and restaurants and so on, uh, this has been a very, very difficult year, and um, we do have a, a good deal of um, sympathy uh, for them in regard to uh, the impact of, of COVID, um, and perhaps that will be seen as something that will give um, a bit of a push to the um, a relaxing of, of, of licensing um, legislation. Um, that may be so, and, and perhaps we're swinging against the tide, and so be it. Um, our, our concern is not so much with the, um, uh, with the extension of licensing laws and uh, opening hours and so on, although we have concerns about that, um, but it's the overall consumption of alcohol. Now, we recognize that um, this is not part of this bill, but I, I, when I've got the chance, I'm going to make the point again. And I think uh, the Public Health Agency have made the same um, um, point uh, again very forcefully that what we need is a minimum, price and see, uh, a minimum pricing policy. And as I say, it's not part of this bill, but I'm sure uh, those who are on the committee uh, will perhaps in other contexts be able to um, uh, address uh, this issue. Um, there are things that uh, we welcome, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, protection for children, and uh, that seems to be there, but um, the question of vending machines and so on. Uh, all of those things uh, that will limit harm, um, we welcome. Those things that will exacerbate potential harm are what our concern are. Now, I know that uh, some of you will push back, because uh, uh, I've seen it elsewhere, that uh, what, what, is the, uh, what is the evidence that increasing opening hours uh, increases harm? Um, well, I'm a simple sort of fellow and I think in straight lines, and uh, uh, this is just how I would work it out. That if you increase opening hours, you clearly have to increase um, staff costs. And the only way, therefore, if you're increasing staff costs to make a, a, a profit or break even on that is for there to be an increase in the consumption of alcohol. Um, uh, so, uh, whatever the statistics are about that, and I think probably there's limited research, uh, common sense says that the longer um, pubs and clubs and places are open serving alcohol, uh, the more potential harm um, there is. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what the figures are in another year's time. Uh, the NISR figures from last year, the death rates at uh, the highest, uh, 2019, the highest on record. Uh, and so that, that underlines our, our concerns. Uh, as the, the final point, just I will re reiterate that uh, we recognize that, um, that this legislation is probably going to go through. Um, hopefully, we don't have the situation we had in 1617 when we had a collapse, and that's why the, th the thing didn't happen. Um, it's a little bit worse than what we had in 17, 1617, uh, but uh, we recognize that we're a small voice in this, and the pressure from industry and, and so on will, uh, will no doubt. Um, uh, overtake us. Uh, so the, uh, the final word is that um, for, for, for us as a church, what we would really like to see is a proper uh, minimum pricing policy that would actually begin to reduce the harm effects of alcohol in our society. Thank you. Thank you. And can I thank all three of you, Lindsay, Karen and David. Um, I, I thank you for coming and briefing the committee. I think it's essential as a committee we get a balance of views across a broad spectrum of people. So I think it's vitally important that you're here today as well also to brief us. Um, David, can I just say I grew up uh, in a very much a free Methodist household. Um, so I understand uh, very, very well um, how some attitudes have changed, albeit they haven't changed dramatically. Um, but um, I, I understand that the, the ethos behind what you were saying, um, certainly from a, from a, a pastoral side. Um, I understand some of the, the, well, I understand the majority of the points you've made up and I, you, you've put your points across very well. Um, I, I just wanted to, 
to, to hone in just a little bit. Actually, Lindsay, you had mentioned about Carlisle House, and we had heard, and I heard it on the radio this morning, where there, the, the lady was talking and saying about the lack of services that we have here in Northern Ireland for people when it comes to alcohol abuse. And I know it's not part of this bill, but it is something that um, that certainly feeds in as well um, when we look at the likes of Carlisle House and the magnificent work that Carlisle House do and they absolutely do. I have had reason or I've had cause to be involved with Carlisle House in the past both on a, a professional level and also through a family member um, and you know really if we don't have those services in place we know um, and certainly it's my belief in itself, alcohol is not dangerous, but alcohol overconsumption is most certainly dangerous and is dangerous to you know not only the individual to the family but to society as a whole. So I'd like to see that you know those services, albeit it's not in this bill, but more services um, to help those people in need. Um, that just on the idea of a review, I'm glad you said that. Uh, Karen, I was going to ask you that. Um, I know that something we asked of the, of the public health agency as well last week and, and of others that if we had a, if there was a review mechanism in place um, to look at the, the various um, extensions within this bill, um, would that ease your mind in, in any way, shape or form? Um, uh, you're absolutely right. You are a small part and there is a big industry out there. We have been fighting for many years to see um, relaxations within our within our, our bill. Um, so just to ask on on the idea of a review, uh, would it put your mind at rest in any way if we were to, to try and see make sure that that was the case? Um, I think that it would be. I suppose it would be helpful. I think the. Um, because of the changes are so much more extensive than what had originally been um, planned or what had been originally been proposed in the previous um, legislation. And I think it wasn't on the face of the bill last time, but certainly in some of the um, debates around the bill that um, were had in the Assembly, the matter of review seemed to be there as a, um, a sort of implicitly. And I think, um, I mean, a review would be helpful, I think, for everyone to see what the impacts are um, in terms of for the industry as well as for those um, agencies and organisations that then have to facilitate, I guess, the the more negative end of um, overconsumption of alcohol in relation to police and criminal justice um, health and just to see where, you know, where resources are being taken. I mean, um, the police service still haven't provided, I don't think, um, a figure to the committee um, in relation to what the co what their estimated costs are, but one of the things they, um, it said in the EFM and relating to the bill was that they anticipated a change to their shift patterns and their systems. So um, what, you know, how will we know what the impact of, of that is unless, um, unless we ask those questions? And so a review, a review might then say that um, everything's working, working great and so leave things as they are, but it will also help to highlight where some um, tweaks might need to be made or where some medications might be required, Chair. And I suppose I'd just follow on from that. If we look at our at, at the, the staffing, and you're, you're not the first to bring up um, this, we did have a, a union in. Um, to brief us a couple of weeks ago that brought up the issue around staff and around their right to observe um, uh, uh, Easter Sunday. Um, so would, there, would you would like a review of that also? I mean, we talk very much in, in, as a government and as a, as a, as a committee and, uh, about co-design of all, everything that we do, but quite often the people that it impacts the most are not part of the consultation process. Um, so, um, I just to ask, would you want to see that as part of a review as well, that the staff are asked their opinion on how it is working for them? Um, well, I think any review would need to be holistic in, in its approach, and I suppose um, echoing some of the things that the Public Health Agency said um, when they briefed you last week, um, this needs to be undertaken in like a whole systems approach. Um, can't tinker with licensing on the one hand, but not realise then that that has an impact. Um, on in other areas that not don't necessarily fall under the remit of the Department of Communities, but there needs to be some sort of joint up thinking. And so I think um, the any review would need to take everything in the round. So impact on staff, um, even in terms of you know their own personal safety, getting home, what the impact of um, extended hours are on their um, on their well-being. 
and the issue just around um, Easter observance as well would I think that would be I think that would be helpful. I don't know if that can be stipulated in the legislation as such, but if there was some way to to get a commitment um, in that way, I think that would be useful. And it, I mean, so the, also, go ahead. Sorry, also, I'm sorry. The, the review would also assist greatly in forward planning for services. I mean, Carlisle House and Northlands remains the the two main community based addiction services. And already um, during the, the the COVID crisis, as you all know, there have been an increase uh, of referrals in, in in both those places, and we've had to meet that with with reducing the length of our programs, uh, but increasing the 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 um, the clinical input to that. So, a review would would actually assist in the forward planning that what are going to be the pressures uh, in the future because. Those beds are limited, uh, and, and those centres, by their very nature, have to be of a certain size. But they are useful, and, and, and the waiting lists are substantial. So the review would really assist in that as well. Okay, and just just want to can I ask members if they want to ask any questions? Can they indicate as well? Um, just before I, I finish off, and um, I, I just want to ask a question. Uh, uh, and it's just to, to ask, when it comes to um, Easter Sunday, um, just some will say, why is it any more precious than any other Sunday? Um, that all Sundays are the Lord's Day. Um, just can you just maybe just expand on that as why you feel that that is more important than any other Sunday in our calendar? Well, Chair, if I might have a stab at answering that, I think there are. Um, uh, it, mo most um, religions, uh, w w and we have a, a mixed community clearly in, in Northern Ireland these days, um, uh, will have particular days that have particular significance. Uh, so that for um, for Hindus, for Muslims, uh, for Jews, um, there are particular days uh, that are more holy uh, than others. Um, and uh, so for Christians, um, you might say Christmas and Easter are the two most significant festivals. Um, and we know that um, that Christmas has been um, has been overrun uh, with alcohol misuse, um, and it would be a, a shame, I think, if um, if Easter followed suit. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I've got two members wanting to ask a question. I've got Robin, and then I've got Kelly. So, anybody else can they let me know, uh, Robin? Uh, thank you, Chair, and I welcome Karen Jardine and David Clements and Lindsay Conway, Conway to, to the meeting. And very much what they're saying, uh, Chair, ties in very closely with what we were being advised from the Public Health Authority uh, last last week. Um, I do recognise Karen in a different role, or did recognise her in a different role, uh, uh, and I welcome her in her new role uh, to see us. Uh, you've made the points uh, extremely well, uh, and I've said they've tied in with uh, points made uh, previously. Can I just say two things, Chair? Uh, direct to the to, to the, the the delegation, the, the budget pressures that you're under in terms of uh, uh, the work you're doing in, in the uh, alcohol abuse field. Um, could you maybe just comment on, on where you think those budget pressures might and what the extent of the budget pressures might might be? And can I make just the point, Chair, the, the NISRA report has been referred to by yourself and, and the delegation. And Dr George O'Neill <clears throat> is obviously commenting in the uh, paper today as uh, I think his role is the Chair of Belfast GPs. Uh, <clears throat> it might be useful, Chair, if Dr George O'Neill, if he isn't going to give evidence, indeed might be invited to give evidence based on what he had said in, in his report. But given the NISRA report, perhaps the, the, the delegation might comment on the budget issues that, that are going to create pressures for you. To be sure, the, the, the wider budget implications are those that are going to impact upon the health service, action and emergency, especially uh, in these difficult times, also uh, in law and order. In our particular case, uh, the, uh, the whole delay in the regional uh, eviction program uh, and initiative has really had pressure um, added to 
uh, the work of Carlisle House and, and I know of, of Northlands uh, and other groups. And, and that has to be revisited. There needs to be a regional approach um, uh, to the whole issue of addiction. And uh, sometimes, um, in, in, at times like this, uh, our services, along with other services, are not only the Cinderella services, but maybe the Oakley Sisters as well, as, as we try and, and, and justify extra extra funding. So it's, it's, it's those budgetary implications that I think um, uh, really surface with regards to the added pressure uh, on a Friday, Saturday, uh, Sunday nights in accident emergencies, um, liver disease, mental health, uh, and the law and order debate with regards to uh, the high percentage of offending, uh, of offences committed while under the influence, and then the impact upon upon families with regards to uh, behaviours and, and, and violence uh, from a from a domestic point of view. The budget pressures around Northlands and Carlisle House today. Can you make any comment on those? The funding for Carlisle House uh, comes primarily from the Belfast Trust. Belfast Trust and the Northern Trust have bought all the beds in, in, in Carlisle House. So we are limited to the, the grants that are given from, from the Trust, which come from, from the Department through the Trust, through to us. And then we, re we retain one bed for, uh, for other use that other trusts may, uh, may call on, or individuals, or, or at times other public bodies. But there's not enough money in, in, in this sector, but definitely not with regards to the treatment and very much the aftercare of those in recovery. That is a critical time in, in, in addiction treatment that you put recourse into uh, the treating of the addiction and then the time which is which is really important is in recovery as they return to their communities. We have a seven bed unit in, in Grace Court which assists that uh, and they can stay there until uh, up until two years. But we have to, to think seriously through all of that strategy, both uh, the prevention, uh, the treatment uh, and the aftercare are, are vital elements to uh, to this whole issue. And, and, and just generally your fears are that the relaxation of the uh, licensing laws are going to impact significantly on, on those pressures? Yes, David put it well, Chair. Um, you know, the, the, the simple equation is increased consumption will, will equate to increased uh, problems. It's that easy. Um, uh, and you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, the, uh, I think the comparison to uh, the 2016 debate and, and this debate, uh, there's a greater flexibility in this bill that, that, that wasn't there in 2016. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just to let members up there, to make members aware, the PSNI will be coming in to brief us on the 25th of February, so there will be um, just to, to let you aware of that. And Karen, I, I thought I recognised your face, and I thought, I, did I not remember her from these corridors up here? So good to see you, Karen, and, and all the very best with, with your position you're in now. Um, I have Kelly, Mark, and then Karen, so I'm going to go to Kelly first. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Lindsay, Karen, and David. Um, I very much appreciate your input for this. Um, Chair, actually, just following on from the guy's presentation today, I was going to say, could we possibly, as a committee, if everyone agrees, um, write to the Minister for the Economy to um, clarify the position to protecting Christians in the workplace, to ensure that they will be protected and not, um, and there's a way for them to refuse. Um, to work um, over Christian holidays, um, so that they that if there is any extension to Easter um, licensing, that they are not forced to work at a time that that obviously is, is quite um, important. Um, and I think that that would be appropriate for us to to make sure that that, that is extended. Um, it's not just Christmas that is protected. I absolutely agree with you guys on the minimum alcohol pricing. Um, I believe that it's something that has been outstanding. We know that it's not within this bill, but um, again, perhaps we should write to the the 
the Minister of Health and ask if there's any updates on what's happening with minimum alcohol pricing from health's perspective um, and we can see if there's any moves forward on that. I know it's, uh, the Minister of Health is very um, busy at the moment, but we can certainly ask a question. Um, Folks, I wanted to ask you, you've mentioned there about the funding for your, your services and they're very essential services. And I'm just thinking, is there a way that we can encourage um, the trade itself to take a bit more responsibility? And I'm thinking about um, how potential funding could come around. And I'm wondering, at time of licence renewal, or if there has been a breakdown and enforcement have to be taken against a... a, a, a a place that sells alcohol, if there was an element of funding or fines or, see fines is a bit difficult because then you don't know how many fines that there would be, but if there was a, a commitment from the industry to support um, addiction, would that be something that you guys would want to see happening or is that the wrong way to look at this? Is that just saying that you, you have the problem and it's the problem then you know pays for the solution? Um, I'm just, I would be really interested in your thoughts on that. It's not a new concept. It, it, it was discussed many years ago. I think uh, one of the Guinness Foundations uh, endeavoured to uh, to address this issue. And, and David, yeah, I'm not sure uh, whether the Methodist Church were involved in these discussions, but it did, it did, it did raise an ethical dilemma. Uh, especially for the churches. Uh, but when you think of the, 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 the proceeds of crime initiative, I know that we benefit from that in, in Thompson House, which is our offending, uh, you know, our, our, our ex-offenders hostel. So, I mean, that's the same, you know, that has developed as a concept over the years, and I think that's, I think it's worth revisiting. Uh, because the proceeds of crime give us, uh, I mean, that was that was a good use of, of that money. And, and I think this is what you're suggesting is, is along the same line. Yeah. So I, I think it's worth revisiting uh, because we are living in different times and there's a different approach to that. Okay. The other, the, the other issue would be a levy that, that then wouldn't be associated. I mean, that... If that levy or, or whatever penalty was clearly associated with with the treatment of the case, then there would be an easier uh, an easier formula to follow. Yep. But that's the only worry. Uh, the only worry I would have with that is um, if it's based on enforcement. Um, we don't know how much money. There wouldn't be a set amount of money coming forward from that. Um, yeah, it's sort of, um, we want to stop the abuse at a source, you know what I mean? But no, thank you very much, folks. It's a lot to think about. Um, there's a lot that I can agree with you on, and there's a lot for me to consider, and, and you know, as we're going forward, and there certainly could be areas that we could propose or amend um, to tighten up. Um, certainly addiction is a huge issue, and I know the, the committee will be looking at gambling, um, hopefully later in the year as well. Um, it, we have to address this for Northern Ireland. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I suppose just on the back of Kelly's comments, um, we know within the gambling industry that there is a levy is placed on them um, for addiction services, um, but I don't know how successful that has been. Certainly, I sit on the all-party group on gambling as well, and it has flagged up a number of issues around that, um, but it, it's, I suppose it is something that could be explored um, as to how, uh, because there are, there are big industries making lots of money off the backs of, of, of people and and many of those people and their families suffer greatly um, for that. So it is something, um, I'm glad Kelly, Kelly brought it up, I hadn't thought about it, um, that could be explored further. Um, maybe it won't go into this bill, but it is certainly something that we need to look at. Um, I'm going to then bring in Mark, then Karen, then Alex. So Mark. Thank you, Chair, and uh, morning to the the crew that have come in there with the presentation. I'd like to thank you, first of all, I think, for such a, a thoughtful uh, submission. I mean, you, you clearly recognise that the levels of public support for modernisation, and your critiques do accommodate some level of change. But I, I'd wanted to pick up on, on two points in particular that you discussed. 
and then Kelly picked up on the same too just before me, and that was around uh, workers' rights and addiction. A number of the, the concerns you've raised about how this bill would affect workers in the industry, it chimes with what we heard from Unite the Union two weeks ago, I think it was now, but in your experience, do members of your churches face any pressure or difficulties when it comes to not working on religious holidays? Like in terms of the pub and, and hospitality sector, are you aware of any issues that your, your, your British counterparts of staff find it difficult to resist pressure to work over Easter, for example? Uh, I'll make a stab at that to say, um, first of all, um, I'm not aware of a lot of members of my congregations and previous congregations have been, um, who work in this industry. Um, partly maybe that's, again, their Methodist ethos as they're being brought up. Um, and uh, it's more often a case of people having to work over holidays who are in essential services, healthcare and so on. And obviously um, that's a, a different um, thing, um, a different category in, in some ways. Um, but there, there, there is an increasing pressure if you don't have um if, if you don't have the, um, the the legal right um to say no to a certain thing um then um you um potentially are in a, in a difficult position and uh, I, I i dare say probably most people would just go with it and say well my job is more important than going to church on easter sunday and so uh they will buckle um but that that oughtn't to be um the society that we live in um, if I could just add in something there in relation to actually younger people, and um, often it'd be you know younger people maybe working in um, bars and restaurants and that sort of thing, and they might not have the feel the same confidence to to ask um, in that way. But if there was some protection in law, that um, that would maybe just give them that extra little bit of confidence that they might need to to be able to to do that. I think. No, no, that, that's good. And I suppose on that basis, I, I had no, no difficulty supporting the, the proposal. If it was that that Kelly had made there in terms of writing to the economy minister uh, around this issue, and, and it's important that, that everyone here is afforded protections. You know, in, in terms of the addiction element and the support that, that you guys provide the individuals with addictions and their families, it's clear that there are issues around funding and we've, there are a couple of the members here have, have floated ideas about how more funding might be got and, and the idea of a levy I think is a, a fair, fair enough one. However, how we would pitch that or could you make that part of this bill, I, I'm not sure it's fair to put it on individual license holders when there are massive multinational uh, corporations who are making the, the, the real money here. But uh, Kelly had suggested they're writing to the health minister in terms of seeking an update on the minimum unit pricing uh, issue. But I, I, I propose that then we add into that just in, in terms of funding for addiction services because it is grossly underfunded and uh, grossly under pressure. Uh, uh, you mentioned Northlands Centre there. I, I, I was in the Hello. Hello. Hiya. Oh, hold I was on a wee minute. Guys there's, somebody, last week. there's somebody answering a phone and we can hear the. Don't know where that's come from. So don't so just if anybody's listening it in. It wasn't here. me this time. No, it wasn't you. We're not blaming you. Just uh, we can hear background noise. But sorry, Mark, I'll go back to you. Yeah, but uh, in terms of that correspondence to the, the health minister, I think it's important that we maybe ask or, or reinforce the, the call for increased funding for addiction services as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I've got uh, Karen. Karen, waiting to come in. Karen. Thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, I want to commend you on the work that you do. Um, and um, I, I will take on board the concerns that you have raised this morning. Um, it's more of a comment than a, a question because some, some of what I want to ask has been asked. Um, most very much want alcohol to be consumed in a controlled and safe environment. Um, all of us here have seen the increase in uh, drinking at home, um, even before COVID, and uh, I, I fear what the impact is going to be when we do come out of, come out of this and we are seeing it firsthand. 
This morning here in uh, my local area or my local radio station, there was a heartbreaking story um, that an 18 year old girl gave along with her grandmother around losing her mom at the age of 41. It was only happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, she was highlighting the lack of services here in Derry. And Mark has touched on it there as well around the, the need for investment. Um, um, as I say, I really, really worry coming out of this in terms of it. Uh, we do need to speak, Sharon and uh, Lindsay, you, you sort of touched on it around all systems approach. Um, and uh, I would very much welcome that. Um, we need to see the support and investment immediately from health. We know the consultation on tackling alcohol and drug harm is, is closing tomorrow. Um, uh, and, we, we, and that work will be going on in terms of the, the new strategy. Lindsay had touched around, um, again, back to funding, being the Cinderella service. We are seeing here locally in Derry that, you know, the only place to present is A&E, um, and, and it's heartbreaking, as I say. So I would support Mark's um, proposal there around the increase for funding, um, that we, we really need to see that um, immediately. We need to start tackling it at the moment. I just feel we're failing so many people. I know this is sort of a bit off track and, 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 and sorry, but uh, and I just thought it was important to highlight it. And then back with that, the really interesting points that you are making around the staffing. Uh, that it was yourself, Karen, even if we're going home at night. I live in a city where there's no public transport after a certain time. And taxis late at night is like hen's teeth. So we need all the departments coming together. We need that collective approach to start looking at it and um, about protecting workers and safety. So as I say, thank you so much today for your contribution because it's certainly opened my mind to all those uh, elements that we need to be working on uh, as well as this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Karen. Um, can I ask Alex if you can come in? There we go. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, we can't hear you. No, you got me now, yeah. I've got you now. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, you've given me lots of food for thought. A um, couple of points you've, you've made. Um, I think we certainly need to look at protecting those uh, with a faith who maybe don't want to work on a on a Sunday or an Easter, if if that goes ahead, um, the impact it's going to have on your services. Do you do you feel that your services could be swamped if these changes go ahead? Um, and also you made the comment about society changing, and yes, it, it certainly is, um, and it's maybe not a necessarily a good thing. Um, and just because society is changing, us as politicians doesn't mean that we have to go along with that. Um, and I think we we have to try and have a, an approach where we try and protect society from, from any harm. So I was just wondering, can you comment about, do you feel your services could be overstretched if these changes go ahead? Sure, I think combined with, with the COVID out, you know, outworking yeah. of, of, of addictions is, is going to be uh, a real issue. Uh, and I suppose the timing of the bill is, is not good in, in that context that we do predict that there's going to be, and, and, and words like tsunami have been used over, over, over the past uh, a few days about mental health issues. And addictions come into that whole program of care. So how we manage that in the future is 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 going to have to be in partnership with our with our colleagues in in the department and the trust. I think we, society is is responding, and and I think it's anecdotal. There's no research to support it. That consumption of alcohol has remained the same, if not increased, during the COVID crisis. And that is clearly illustrating that the, the, that the supermarkets, the off-licenses uh, and home delivery and so forth. I noticed in was it the Telegraph yesterday that, that Amazon have stopped uh, delivering alcohol to Northern Ireland because of, of whatever uh, protocol or whatever difficulty we're in. Uh, so whether that's a, 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 good, a, a good news story or a bad news story. 
But as all of those issues are going to impact upon uh, society, and family life has greatly impacted some for the good and brought bringing families together. Um, the the COVID has again added those pressures within families, and the sad increase of of both child and, and, and adult abuse has been significant. Um, society has has a different view on, on alcohol. Uh, in some ways, uh, we were very much a culture where, where alcohol was uh, was the demon drink, and we actually didn't teach our young people. Um, the safe drinking that, that was maybe achievable at other times and, and, and different research has, has pointed to that, that the binge drinking is out of that culture and that has been a time bomb that has ticked uh, for some time. I think we're approaching it in, in a more balanced way, uh, but this is possibly uh, the timing, I say, is not good that um, the increase in licensing hours and what that means uh, uh, to to the night culture and so forth, I think is an unknown quantity at the moment. Uh, can I make two comments briefly uh, in response to Alex's question? First of all, uh, I, I don't think it's good for us to um, exaggerate uh, a bigger position. Um, increasing the um, half hour extra drinking up, um, opening on Easter, and the other bits and pieces in in, in the bill, uh, which we object to, um, are not going to make. Um, a massive difference. Um, they're not going to help, they're going to do some harm, but it's not going to be a massive amount of harm extra. So that's the first thing to say, uh, keep it in perspective. The second thing to say though is is the kind of um, the negative thing in that there is an enormous amount of alcohol harm in our um, society, health, um, um, criminal justice, all of those areas. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a big issue. Um, and just to reiterate the point that I concluded with, that um, there needs to be um, harm reduction, there needs to be minimum pricing, there needs to be way, and it, it doesn't fit into this bill all that easily perhaps, and it may be for health and other departments to, to, to pick this up. Uh, so that th this the change in this legislation proposed is not good, um, but it's not going to make a catastrophic difference. It's not going to bring a tsunami of, of harm, but the tsunami is still there nonetheless. Uh, and it's the underlying increasing um, um, use and abuse of, of alcohol within our culture uh, that is, um, and I uh, echo what somebody else said earlier, that Rockshire Hood was, we don't know uh, what the outcome is going to be in another year's time post COVID. And I suspect um, that uh, whilst clearly there's been much less alcohol consumed um, in restaurants and pubs and so on, um, my gut feeling is that, uh, that the amount of alcohol consumed in homes has increased significantly, and who's to tell what health impact that will have in a year or in five years' time? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, members. Um, just to also say um, that uh, Minister Swan committed to hold a full public consultation on minimum unit pricing. Um, he would said that back on the 29th of July 2020. Um, that he would do it within the year. So I suppose we as a committee can follow up on that um, with the department as to where that is and whether that, that, uh, what plans are for to get that started, um, following on from the briefing today. And uh, also um, there were several proposals, one to the economy minister um, about working hours um, for people of faith. Um, I think that is something that we can certainly do as well as a committee. And then also to do um, the health minister also around the um, increased funding for advice services. Um, so as a committee following on from, from this witness briefing, that's, that, that's actions um, that we can take. So can I thank you, um, Lindsay, David and Karen, for coming in and briefing us today. And thank you for also your submission. OK? Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, OK, members, are members content with those um, actions following that briefing? Agreed. Agreed? Yep. OK. Just to like to check in case I've missed anything out um, of my scribblings here that I sometimes can't make out. OK, members, then we will move on then to agenda item seven. Yep, it's not right. Um, agenda item seven is a briefing from Retail NI, again on the licensing and registration of the club's amendment bill. Members, you'll find the agenda item at page 135 of your pack. And can I welcome to the meeting Glenn Roberts? Um, Glenn, you're very welcome. Can I um, ask you, um, you have to do a maximum of 10 minutes if you want to just give us a, a, a brief. 
Well, Madam Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present today. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail in terms of our presentation. I maybe just want to give a, a, a broader context for, I think, the sensible practical changes that we want to see uh, in the bill. Um, and I think that it very much reflects the crucial importance of retail and hospitality, the symbiotic link between the two sectors in relation to um, our high street. And I think that was brought home to us when uh, you know we the situation you know before Christmas. Um, I, for, I forget which lockdown it was, but you know when most of hospitality was closed, but yet non-essential retail was open. So we, we uh, and, and of course the impact that that had on the high street. So you know we can't do retail and hospitality are 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 linked together. Um, it is that symbiotic relationship. And of course, you know, very much with uh, we, as we begin to focus on the recovery of our high streets, and if you look, we've had some dreadful times over the last few weeks with the uh, effectively the fall of uh, Debenhams, uh, Topshop, Topman, Miss Selfridge, where uh, hundreds of job retail jobs have now been lost and significant vacancies. You know, that means that we're going to have to do a very different model in relation to the 21st century high street and retail and hospitality and particularly independent retailers and hospitality will have a key role in developing that and I think it's about repurposing our town and city centres as unique hubs um, and I think you making them destinations for socialising, culture, health, well-being, creativity uh, and learning and I suppose that all brings back the importance of having modern uh, licensing laws and I think this bill really brings the licensing laws uh, up to date. I think in terms of what practical changes that we want to see, uh, I, think, I think the main one is the restrictions of the proposed restrictions on advertising in supermarket and off sales, um, where effectively they're, you're, you're looking at uh, the advertising being done uh, quite a bit away uh, from the, the store, I think 200 metres was the figure that was uh, quoted in the legislation, the draft legislation. And of course, the difficulty there is that, that that's fine for perhaps a large supermarket who can put the signage in their car park. But if you're a small independent retailer, a small independent off licence, then that, that does pose uh, significant difficulties. And of course, you know, if, you know, if you're a small retailer, every bit of space inside your store is, is, is absolutely uh, precious. Um, so I think that, that is perhaps one change that we would like to see uh, in the bill. I think we've outlined the need, obviously, for our, our members to be responsible in terms of those who sell alcohol, particularly, and I listen quite intently to your, uh, previous, uh, your, your previous contributors about the need for the industry to be responsible. Um, retail and I members, you know, by and large are small or they have off licenses, you know, they're independently owned, they're responsible. They can't do big drinks promotions where they're selling larger, cheaper than water. Um, and you know, they very much uh, uh, as community retailers take that role of the health of their community very, very seriously indeed. I think that obviously looking at where we are with the pandemic, um, and, you know, with obviously the big increase of, of people drinking at home, um, you know, there are significant challenges there. You know, we will have to face a, uh, I suppose, a mental health uh, epidemic and all sorts of changes and pressures on society uh, when, we, uh, when this lockdown is lifted and we advance to the vaccine. So there are problems there, but our members very much take their community role and responsible alcohol retailing very, very seriously indeed. So I think that there, there are a number of, of changes there, but I think that f first and foremost, um, you know, we, we do very much support many of the things our colleagues in Hospitality Ulster. We have a very close working relationship with our friends in Hospitality Ulster, and I know that uh, they have fought long and hard for this legislation to be brought forward. I think it's also perhaps just to draw 
uh, Madam Chair, your two, two <coughs> committee as well, our colleagues in the Association of Convenience Stores, who have also uh, put forward a, a, a submission. So we have absolutely endorsed all that they have said, and indeed that's reflected in our own uh, submission. So I didn't want to perhaps go over what we've already submitted in writing to you, uh, and I'm very happy again perhaps to take any questions on what we put forward or the context in which this legislation and the context of which this legislation being brought forward is, uh, is, uh, is important as well. Okay, Glenn, look, thank you for that. And you certainly stuck within your 10 minutes, which is good as well. Allows us a bit more time. Um, you, just to pick up on your point then there to do with smaller stores, and I absolutely understand where you're coming from on that, so do And I know some of our smaller stores, and I certainly, as someone who's been shopping in smaller stores for the past year, find them actually to have been so much safer during the entire uh, COVID period. Um, than some of our larger stores because they have been very strict in what they're doing. Um, just when, when it comes to the legislation then for the advertising for smaller stores, um, are you saying that they should not have any form of restriction put on them or are you coming up with a, a, a different form of restriction? Well, I think first and foremost, the, I mean, th this is nothing new. In previous incarnations of this uh, legislation or consultation that has been there, um, you know, we've looked at you know, the, the difficulties that, 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 for instance, a similar scheme in Scotland has done. So, you know, by and large, you know, where our members advertise uh, alcohol, it, it probably is in the context of, say, for instance, a meal deal or something like that. Um, you know, so it, it's, not, uh, it's not in any way targeted at young people. It is very responsible. Um, and, you know, I think that it really just to, I think that is the one area of this bill that I think it falls down in doesn't reflect the reality that, you know, we have many more independent retailers uh, than, you know, percentage-wise than, than many other parts of the UK. We, you know, we have very many long-established uh, off-licenses. And, of course, what we're, what we're really saying is we want to see a level of playing field. And, you know, the, the, what we have at the minute, I think, works really well in terms of the advertising that uh, independent retailers can do. Um, and I think it, it's really, as we've said all along in this and other legislation, it's about levelling the playing field. Okay, thank you for that, Glenn. I want to move on to another issue that you highlight that you highlight in your paper that I don't, I, I haven't picked up on on many other witness sessions, and that's the issue around um, persistent number of restaurants that sell alcohol illegally. And I know certainly um, there of of at least one in my own area that I represent, um, where they are paying a restaurant license, but it is run more as a bar. Um, you'd highlighted that in your paper. Can you, uh, if it, can you propose um, how we prevent that, or you know that 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 they they operate outside the the terms of their license? Well, there's no doubt that they have to stay in, in within what their license asks them to do. They have to stay uh, in very much uh, what the law says. I think we did make a point there in relation to breweries. Uh, uh, and other similar establishments that they want effectively the same type of alcohol license as, uh, as bars and restaurants has. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to work and it'll probably cause duplication. I know colleagues in hospitality also have particular concerns about that. Listen, I mean, I think that, you know, we're not really in all of this here. We have to be responsible in, in what we do. And, you know, if you look at the context of the, the lockdown, the very severe restrictions that bars and restaurants operated in. In fact, you know, was, yeah, there's been very little time in 2021 for many of these businesses to, to open. And, you know, whilst retail has had it tough, uh, certainly for many in the hospitality sector, uh, it's a very, very long road back. But nevertheless, they should obey the law. And, you know, where, where you have uh, people are trying to get around, particularly the, a lot of the COVID regulations, that, that clearly doesn't, doesn't help. Because what it means is the executive just clamped down on that behaviour and it, it impacts on the, the responsible businesses, the vast majority of responsible bars and restaurants uh, that have stayed within the law, the spirit of the law and the spirit of the uh, licence in which they operate on. Okay, thanks, Glenn. And just finally, before I bring in members, I just want to ask you your, your uh, opinion around the Code of Conduct 
um, just whether it should be continued to be industry led or as proposed by the Public Health Agency last week, that um, we should look at more statutory led. Um, so what's your opinion on that? Well, I think there are so many different codes and conducts that are out there. Um, some are led by the industry. Uh, you know, uh, I think we'd be very much keen to engage with the, the PHA on that, what they uh, are planning to do. But I think that you know we have already our, our members are obviously are operating as sort of the Challenge Twenty Five rule. Um, they are you know obviously under huge scrutiny about uh, the need to avoid underage sales and to sell alcohol responsibly. And of course, if you put that in sort of the, the, the wire context, you know, you, you will not see the same type of deals on, you know, six cans of beer or lager, uh, heavily, heavily discounted, effectively a lost leader in the large supermarkets. You wouldn't tend to see that in anywhere near the same way uh, in many small off-licenses as well, independently owned off-licenses. So um, they are responsible um, and, you know, they have actually went out of their way in recent years to, you know, for instance, source a lot of local craft beers and things like that. that you know, we've seen a big increase in breweries and local gins and things like that, craft beer in particular. Um, a lot of our, our members have went out of the way to support those local suppliers and make sure they're stocked within their stores. So I, I can only emphasize that our members are responsible retailers in relation to alcohol and will continue to be. And, you know, there's, there's, there's quite rightly should be very strict standards there. And, you know, particularly uh, as we are at the minute, where obviously increased number of people, numbers of people are drinking at home because our friends in hospitality are obviously closed and will probably be the last ones back in relation to when lockdown is lifted. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, can I just ask members if you want to ask a question of Glenn? Can you use your, your raise your hand function on your Starleaf? I have Sinead and then I have Kelly. So, Sinead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for coming in again, uh, Glenn. Glenn, I just want to <clears throat> take you back to the um, advertising uh, issue. And um, so we, we've had this conversation with um, another witness that came in. For, forgive me, it, it escapes my mind now just who that was. But um, Clause 16 uh, of, the, of the proposed bill, it actually states that um, in the license and order, which is uh, in relation to the restrictions on off sales, uh, drinks promotions in supermarkets, um, that it restricts the advertising of drinks promotions in supermarkets to the area in which intoxicating liquor may be displayed in such premises and that supermarkets and other licensed premises which sell intoxicating liquor for consumption at home will also not be allowed to advertise drinks promotions available in the premises within the vicinity of the premises. So I know you were saying there that uh, larger supermarkets might have a the upper hand in terms of being able to advertise in their in their car park, whatever. But actually, what what clause sixteen is saying is that they wouldn't be able to. Um. So I know you're 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 saying about a level a level playing in field, and I'm very much supportive of that. But I think clause sixteen ensures that there will be. Um. And I know that it also gives the department the power to make the uh, regulations to amend the definition of vicinity. So that's a piece of work that this committee can do in terms of scrutiny and and having that conversation with the department as they, this bill progresses, then that's something we will do. But I just want to clarify that point that, to me, reading that Clause 16, it doesn't offer supermarkets any sort of upper hand in terms of smaller off sales. It, it says that any advertising, whether it's in a supermarket or a smaller off sale, must be restricted to the vicinity in which uh, they're, they're actually licensed to sell the alcoholic product. Well, I think that, thanks for that. That's a good, well-made point, Shane. I think the, th the thing is that, um, as I referred to earlier, is that you would see for it. Not, I mean, if, if the advertising, and obviously, in within a, a small independent retailer, an independent retailer, obviously the 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 off license is, is is separate to, but connected into the rest of the store. And I think that why I think we we would be keen to see flexibility on this is that, for instance, a lot of our members would advertise in other parts of the store, things like beans, where you would get, you know, they would obviously maybe sell or promote a particular 
bottle of bra- a bottle of wine along with a particular type of meal deal. And you know, and I think that is a responsible. I, I mean, that's a fair enough thing for them to be able to do. Uh, if that is just restricted to uh, the part of the store where they have the off license, then it it, it sort of puts uh, restrictions. And I, I can't really see the the logic in that. Um, it all gets back to the message which retailers and I suppose a lot of the drinks companies want to put forward. Um, and you know, all we can say is that you know we we have to be responsible uh, in, in everything that we do and the message that we put forward, particularly to uh, younger people as well. But all I say is that for many you know, retailers, the, the, the space they have in the store is precious, particularly if we see independent retailers. Um, and I think that, you know, that is the context uh, that we sort of make those remarks is that, you know, we just want to ensure that there is um, um, that flexibility there for smaller traders. Mm-hmm. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Um, and for those just from our point of view, we're, tra- we're trying to balance the very, um, you know, important public health uh, side of this here, as well as trying to, you know, show fair play to the to the businesses that you represent as well. Um, and we know that advertising does work. Oh, that's why people do it. That's why it's a multi-billion dollar industry because it does affect people's drinking habits. So, you know, it is, it's something that we're going to have to grapple with. Um, but I do think that there's room within the clause here, um, you know, for, for us to try and shape that. Um, and I think that it doesn't, it's not given those supermarkets that upper hand. Um, it actually clearly states that you, know, you can be convicted of a fine punishable up to a thousand pounds for carrying out um, drinks promotions outside the licensed area. So um, it's something for us to consider. But I think it's we, we do need a bit more clarity on that particular clause going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, I suppose just a, a, that's a very good point that Sinead made there. Um, I know when we even go into the likes of Marks and Spencers or Tesco's where you'll have you know, a side of meat and a dessert and a bottle of wine that's advertised on the aisle where the food is. Um, so they wouldn't, under this then, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. They'd be allowed to do it in the, just the area where the alcohol is sold or 200 metres away from the store in general. Um, so I understand that there are certain complications um, around that. Um, okay, I have Kelly and then I have Mark. So Kelly? Thank you very much. Good to see you, Glenn. Hope you're keeping well during this pandemic. Um, Glenn, I just wanted to speak to you about or ask you about um, what you've included in your uh, presentation about those craft breweries. Um, we've heard quite a lot of evidence on this. Um, one of the things that we are faced as we move forward after COVID um, is potential difficulties for liquid to be um, exported. Um, and our, our craft brewers because they can't sell their own produce um, easily, and that's what they may have to depend upon. But I'm just thinking, um, these, these people are people who potentially be members of yours. Um, do you not think that, or uh, what are your thoughts on developing more of the Northern Ireland produce um, that they're bringing forward? I'm thinking in particular, I have one um, distillery, Eckenville Distillery in my area, who's done a, an amazing job, but they have opportunities to sell from their own premises because of the license, very expensive license that they brought. But I would be sad to see those sort of um, businesses not able to operate because they can't or their their produce is limited. Um, I'm just wondering if they're, you know, having a sample is one thing, but I just don't understand why um, people or what the, the issues would be if they were only selling their own produce not any other produce, not acting like a bar, but they were only selling their own produce, and it even could be for a limited period of time during the day. Um, would that be an issue, or is is that something that, that you could support? Well, I think that it, it it's important that, for instance, what any new licence carry doesn't duplicate uh, what's there in, in the existing licence category. So I, I think that, you know, I think it's fair enough that I don't think anybody goes to uh, a gin brewery uh, to you know to go out up on on the rip, so to speak. It is very much about uh, tasting, um, and you know there's no absolutely no problem with that. I mean, we our our members are very very committed to obviously supporting local 
supporting a lot of those local breweries, you know, and, you know, we've seen where some of those craft brewers and craft beers who, you know, perhaps don't have the uh, capacity at this stage of their business to get into the large supermarkets. And quite often what you'll see is a lot of our members will will stock some of their products. So it's a very important route to market for many of those uh, uh, craft brewers. Um, and and I think that obviously what, what we're always, what our members are always looking to look out for is different distinctive products. So, and you will know, continue very much uh, to do that. I think, you know, it's quite frankly amazing if you look how many gins that are now uh, being retailed and sold now, uh, very, very extensive. Um, you've seen so many local companies and so many local entrepreneurs that have uh, really put Northern Ireland's gin on the market and indeed um, internationally so as well. When you look at the success of products like Jawbox in particular, um, and uh, so again, you know, we, our members will always want to look out for good local products, um, and uh, you know, because it's it's the way that they often promote themselves as offering different products. Um, and you know, as I've said, I think the last time I presented to you, it's crucially important we develop this localism contact, this localism concept, because it is about supporting the whole supply chain. Um, and recognizing the, the, the huge potential that is there uh, in terms of your local producers, manufacturers and so on. Thanks, Glenn. Can I just ask you as well, we've heard from many others, the cost of the licenses appears to be staggering. But the actual cost through the court is minimal. It's, it's not unaffordable. The cost comes from that sort of private market where people negotiate licenses outside. Um, that must be impacting on quite a lot of um, convenience type stores who may want to sell alcohol, corner shop or you know local um, garage, for instance. Quite a lot of them would, would be looking for an off license, especially in rural areas. Um, do you think that there should be anything done to curtail that type of negotiation or, or you know, that ramps the prices up to unaffordable levels. Have you any thoughts on that? Well, I, I suppose that trying to undo that whole sort of surrender principle, there's a big challenge there because, you know, we would have members that would have obviously alcohol licenses and pay quite a lot of money. It's part of the assets of their business. So if we went down the road of deregulation, then, you know, we were going to have a lot of members who are not going to be very happy because the alcohol license they have is part of the assets of the business. So, and I, and I don't detect that there is any uh, appetite across the assembly for deregulation in that area. Um, so I think it, it, it's, it's, it, uh, it's not covered in the legislation of, of this bill, but you know, again, it, it is about uh, leveling the playing field um, and you're making sure that, you know, if, if a, you start convenience or food store wants to get a alcohol license, they're not priced out of the market. But it is a complicated issue um, and it's not one that's going to be easily solved anytime soon. And you know, there isn't the appetite amongst, I think, the, the main political parties in the Assembly for any changes in that area. I know, and that's the difficulty with it because um, unfortunately I see like your members and, and we talk to um, others, you know, about that. It just seems to be unbelievable costs um, that are continue on, but we'll leave that for now. It's not going to be dealt with in this bill. Um, I'm very aware um, that we've just spoken to the Presbyterian Methodist churches um, and we brought up the issue of addiction services. Um, I'm just wondering, what do you think about... Um, you know, that sort of levy for addiction. Um, it's not within the bill at the moment, but I just, I'm, I'm very aware that we don't want to price out um, your members. Um, but is there something there that could potentially be added to a, a code of practice or uh, an industry um, agreement for that type of investment in addiction services? Well, so we're very happy to have the, the conversation. I think that uh, you're putting a levy on an independent retailer um, in that regard, I think it would probably be a step too far. But do we have a role to play in terms of tackling this problem? Of course we do. Um, you know, I had a very good discussion with the mental health champion about uh, obviously the mental health of many of our members' staff um, in this difficult, but you know, it's, a, it's become a, a much wider issue, you know, with the health of our 
the mental health of our population as we come out of this lockdown, as we start to get back to some form of uh, normal life, there's a huge problem, a huge challenge there. And I'm very conscious that the mental health champion will have her work cut out uh, after this panel. And, I, you know, we had a mental health crisis before the pandemic. Goodness knows where we are now with it. But are we and are our members willing to play a role? Of course we are. I, you, you probably heard me context our members, their community entrepreneurs, their community retailers. They take their role in the community very seriously. And if you look, um, you know, as we speak now, and in, in particularly in many small towns and villages, you know, the role of the convenience store, the butcher, the small chemist, they are as much a community service as the GP or as, as the dentist. Um, and they take their role seriously in terms of making sure uh, vulnerable people, older people have that access to food. Uh, people who don't have maybe access to uh, transport, who can't get out to the big out of town stores, those small retailers are an absolute lifeline. So, of course, we want to be part of that conversation in relation to uh, mental health and making sure the physical and mental health of our population as a whole is addressed. Absolutely. Yeah, no. Glenn, um, no, thank you very much. I have a local garage near me, um, probably one of your members, um, who's, who, to be honest, is is the lifeline for the, my rural community. Apart from petrol and diesel, you know, you can go in there and buy bread and, and, and everything, just everything that you can think of. Um, and they are a family and a and part of our community, absolutely. Um, just as I, an end, um, like to thank you and all your members for the work that they have done throughout this pandemic because we encourage people to shop local. Your guys provided those services and all their staff. And um, I have to say the you know, checking people who are under 25, I was quite delighted actually with my local shop that they did ask me for ID when I was buying a bottle of wine. Um, quite pleased about giving them double that age but um, yeah <laughs> I think Connor was being too nice to me but um, no your members have been absolute champions through this and, and having your input for them and um, this is fantastic thank you very much well I, it's funny I got asked the same thing um, a few weeks ago was I over 21 and uh, obviously it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to, to hug the, the shop worker you know, particularly in the in the COVID restrictions, but uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll take any compliments I can get these days. You know, um, you know. Okay, thank you. I, I, want, I want to raise a complaint. I haven't been asked if I'm over twenty. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. Look, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, okay, members. Our last person wants to ask a question is Mark. So, Mark, can bring Mark in. Uh, thank you, Chair. You're very welcome, Glenn. I was just wondering, were you wearing a, a face covering at the time? I, I was, Mark, yes, obviously, yeah. That explains it. Okay. It probably just, was. Uh, no, but I, I'd like to start by echoing, I suppose, the, the words of, of Kelly in terms of the role uh, that, well, your members, and I suppose so many in the retail have played over the pandemic. You know, uh, you, your staff there making sacrifices and indeed taking risks uh, to ensure the rest of us can, can go about uh, our lives as normally as possible and don't go without the things that, that, that we need. But just in terms of, of your submission, there's just a couple of wee questions I had, Glenn. One is in terms of, like the, I think you say, it's around deliveries of alcohol, part three of your submission. Yeah. You're opposed to any strengthening of the law on age verification and the delivery of alcohol. But if, as you say, and you do say in this document, it is best practice in the industry to verify age for remote sales, why would making it a statutory duty constitute a burden to responsible sellers? Well, I, I think it's, you know, there are so many rules and regulations, code of conduct. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously we have, for instance, delivery that would cover and other, very few of our members would actually do deliveries. Um, a lot of the, you know, we would have members that would do stuff through uh, delivery. Um, and obviously there's practical issues there about how the age of someone there, is it the delivery guy on the bike that makes that call? Uh, or, so I think it's, it's, we're happy to have a conversation with just, and I think it's in one sense, since the obviously the pandemic, the, the world has changed. Um, 
the role of delivery drivers and things like that um, has put this issue front and center. You know, when we I suppose made this submission, you know, the the you know uh, it was quite some time ago when we didn't have the issue of deliveries coming up in the way that they are now. Do we probably need to revisit it? Yes, we probably do. Okay, now no, that's interesting. And then the, the other wee one I was just going to flag with you, Glenn. You see us here that our responsible marketing and pro promotional techniques yeah. have no place in the licensed trade. Of course, we would all agree with that, I'm sure. But you also say that there are responsible means of promoting and marketing alcohol, including loyalty schemes. I'm just wondering where you would draw the line there or, or who would draw that line between responsible and irresponsible alcohol marketing? Well, I, I think very much the, the PHA, I think, will have a key role in determining what... And I think that, you know, we very much get that, you know, that the, the importance of people are responsible uh, drinking and, you know, with obviously bars and restaurants uh, that are closed and, of course, they themselves are regulated environments. Um, they uh, and it's important that is at home there isn't the same sort of regulation so we have to be very careful in terms of the, the messaging that, that that is put out um, and that it has to be that people need to be uh, looking after the health and you know people are under huge pressure and there's no doubt that alcohol sales have dramatically increased uh, in off licenses so it, it means that whatever message that our members put out um, is is in that context, but again, I think what we do, what we need, and it gets back to what we said. We're very happy to you know engage with the department on this. Very happy to engage in terms of the the public health message with the PHA, um, and also in things like obesity as well. You know, I think that you know if you look at the sort of good practice that our many of our members have done on obesity, I know I'm slightly. Uh, slightly off the, the alcohol license, but, but for instance, where a lot of our members are in the proximity of schools, they've made sure that things like fresh fruit and veg is, is the first thing that you can, you see as you walk into the store. So that promoting that sort of healthy... It's uh, less attractive to the shoplifters. It, it is, it is. But, you know, do we need to have a proper sit down and uh, engage with the Department of Health. Um, yes, we do, and the PHA. I'm very happy to do that. As I said, our members take that community role very, very seriously. Um, they actually do care about um, the, you know, the, their customers. The retail model which we promote is a sustainable community one. And it's not, uh, if you like, this sort of predatory role that a lot the large supermarkets have. You know, and you know the that. And in many respects, the lockdown has reinforced the crucial importance of local. Um, you know, because people, obviously, as you know, Mark, are not travelling. So, you know, people in a lot of ways have rediscovered, you know, local grocery stores, local butchers, uh, that they maybe haven't in normal times. And I think that is one of the few opportunities that this dreadful situation provides and that it reinforces local and and I think there's a big challenge there whether those independent retailers that are open can, uh, if you like, continue to draw and keep that trade when things open up again. Super, Glenn. Thanks a million. Great to see you. Great, Mark. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank you. No other members have um, indicated that they want to ask any questions. Can I also thank you, Glenn, for coming back and briefing us again in committee today? Thank you. My pleasure, Chair. I hope you all keep safe. You too. Thank, thanks, Glenn. Bye. Yeah. Okay, members, um, we're going to move then on to agenda item eight, um, which is a briefing from the Northern Ireland Drinks Industry Group, again on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. You'll find the papers for this agenda item at page 143 of your meeting pack. And then can I then welcome Nicola Carruthers uh, to the meeting? And again, Nicola, can I ask you if you want to begin your brief? You have up to a maximum of 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and just thank you for the opportunity today. Um, our views on the bill, I'm not going to go into them all because they've, they've already been set out on, on our briefing. 
um, but there are just a few points that I would like to raise. Um, we work very closely with Hospitality Ulster and have done for many years, and we'd be very, very supportive of their views in, um, in, in, in supporting the changes. You've heard a lot about, regular, about the changes to Easter hours that are being proposed this morning, um, and that's absolutely, absolutely right that everyone has their opinion on that. Um, not surprisingly, we would be supporting the general industry view on that, that the Easter hours have long needed um, changed. Um, we're working on the legislation that we've had since the 1800s, um, and it is, it is a cause of great confusion for a lot of people. Um, we also support the call for the additional hours for, um, on 104 nights per year. Um, we would also like to see some sort of um, amendment made to allow the small, often rural or community pubs to do the same. We support the new producer's licence as proposed to support local brewers and distillers as proposed in the bill. Um, but most importantly, the provision that would allow industry codes such as the Responsible Retailing Code to be authorised by the department, we believe, is very important. Um, this has been raised and discussed um, by others in the past um, during the evidence you've heard in the past, um, and I just felt that it was worth elaborating um, on this some, somewhat, uh, just, to give the, just to give some background in terms of it. Um, back in 2011, there were really serious problems with some irresponsible drinks promotions in Northern Ireland, and the then minister basically brought all of the industry stakeholders together, told us to sort our act out, or else there would be legislation which would ban every single drinks promotion that, that there was. So we formed a cross-industry group to start work on developing a code which would work across the whole industry. I draw did it with the help of the pubs, the supermarkets, the shops, and the registered clubs and hotels. All sectors were involved in that. We spent a very long time looking at what was already out there. Uh, the code makes reference to other things in force in relation to the Advertising Standards Authority, the Portman Group, etc. But there was nothing there that went as far as we wanted to do in banning specific drinks promotions. There was nothing at all in Great Britain. Um, and then we learned from the experience in the Republic of Ireland where the industry there had de developed two separate codes, one which applied to the on-sales and one which applied to the off-sales. Um, there, there were disparities between the standards in the two, um, so we learnt from that, and we were very, very clear that we wanted to develop one code to work across the whole industry. The codes in the Republic of Ireland haven't survived, um, and they're not there anymore. Um, I drafted the code sort of sitting in the middle representing the suppliers because our customers were both the on and the off trade. So we were sort of in the middle. Um, Hospitality Ulster did not draft the code and are not in charge of the code as some have, um, are, are sort of labouring under the misapprehension really. Um, Hospitality Ulster provides secretarial services to the independent complaints panel, but the panel is completely independent of industry, makes up its own mind and publishes regular reports. Successive ministers um, and the permanent secretary have supported the code in the past, and indeed every single code report has had a forward drafted by either the minister or the permanent secretary. Um, and the last, most recent report said in the forward, I believe the responsible retailing code will continue to play a crucial role in influencing the responsible promotion of alcohol in both the on and off trade. Um, the importance of, the, of giving some statutory backing to industry codes of practice is really in relation to um, enforcement. Um, it would give the code teeth at the minute if the panel finds against the code, or finds that a licensee has breached the code. The, the licensee can appeal the decision um, and then the panel will notify that decision to the press, um, the local PSNI and the local council. Um, in terms of the press, it does get, um, breaches do get coverage. Um, I mean, a number of them have been discussed on the Nolan Show, for example, in the past. But if the code was to be given statutory backing or approval, at least, it would give it added weight um, and would be more likely that all licensees would abide by it um, because the courts, before granting or renewing licences, would need to be satisfied that, they, that the licensee knew about it and was upholding the industry codes. Um, the importance, the, the benefit of having an industry-led code um, since 2012 has been that we've been able to change it quickly as new promotions arise or as things need to change. The code's now in its third edition since 2012, um, and that is a lot quicker rather than having to wait for a statutory change. 
Um, and I think just again, given the references that have been made to it this morning, um, it's important to mention the Department of Health's current consultation on making life better, which is for the new drug and alcohol strategy. Um, we've been involved in the steering group of the current drug and alcohol strategy for many years and on the Department of Health drug alcohol advisory group. And much of what we've put into the code over the years reflects what is in the department strategy in relation to training, provisions relating to underage drinking, labeling, channel or challenge 25, etc. So, Chair, that really concludes my introductory remarks. Um, I could talk a lot about the code because I'm very proud of what the industry has done since 2012, but um, I will leave things there for now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And I know that you've been you've 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 heard the other submissions this morning because I, I know because I saw your name yes. um, on, so, which is good. Yes. So you were able to listen in, and that's good. Um, yes. And it's just on that issue then that the churches had brought up certainly about the um, the, the well, of people having to work on the likes of Easter Sunday, people of faith. Um, wh what would you yeah. say in response to that? You, you heard also that the committee are going to write to the Department of Economy around that. And um, yeah. we certainly are sympathetic to, to that. Um, just what would your opinion on that be? Well, um, you know, I, I, I'm not representing the pubs, but I do know that from discussions in the past with them, that they would say that their members um, do respect the fact that they do have people of faith working for them, um, both Christians and, and other religions. Um, Good Friday isn't actually a public holiday in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know whether that would cause any difficulties in what you intended to do, but I would be absolutely sure that um, pubs and off sales would want to be cognizant of their employees' rights and beliefs and would do everything they could to, to support that. So I honestly can't see that being a problem. And it's not the Good Friday, it's the Easter Sunday. You're right, Good Friday is mm -hmm. not um, a public mm -hmm. holiday in Northern Ireland. It's the Monday that we have the holiday. Yeah. Uh, so it's more to do with the Easter Sunday than, than Good Friday. Um, just I want can't to, being a problem. Okay, I just want to pick up on another couple of points. Um, and it's it's one that I had asked um, uh, Glenn earlier. And I don't know if you can make yeah. any comment on this or not. And it is around those um, bars that are operating, or sorry, those restaurants that are almost operating yeah. as bars. And it is yeah. happening. Yeah. It certainly is happening. Yes, and, it it's, is. and it's damaging um, to our pubs yes. um, because of the amount yes. of money they have to outlay. Um, is there anything Absolutely. that you can see that um, around the uh, code of conduct and various rules that we need to look at to tighten up on that? But this has been, Chair, you're absolutely right. This has been a problem for absolutely years and years and years. Um, and previously, I used to work for the pubs, um, and it's something that that we have been concerned about for for an extremely long time. I mean, the majority of restaurants do operate within the terms of their license. That has to be said. But there are absolutely those restaurants out there which are running as bars. In the past, there was more of a problem in Belfast city centre with restaurants running as nightclubs and using their their restaurant license as a nightclub. That isn't so much of a problem anymore now because the Belfast City Council working in conjunction with the PSNI were able to, to use their entertainment license to, to stop that. But there are certainly restaurants out there which are operating as bars. I mean, the proposal in the, in the bill to require uh, restaurants to put a notice on the wall to say how they're allowed to serve alcohol, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, I can't see it making an absolute massive uh, difference in practice. The difficulty is, is in terms of enforcement. Um, you know, making sure, making a restaurant operate within the terms of its license is understandably not that high up on the on, um, on the priority for the for the PSNI, and they are the enforcement body. Um, you know, there's been reference made to this committee um, over previous weeks about the role of local licensing officers, etc. In England, I mean, we don't have anything like that here. Um, it, enforcement is down to the PSNI, and understandably, you know, restaurants operating outside their license, registered clubs letting non-members in. There, you know, it, it's it's understandably down that list, but it is a real difficulty. Alcohol is meant to be ancillary to the main table meal, and anything which allows someone to sell alcohol in an ancillary way is obviously always going to have problems in terms of enforcement. And there's no easy answer, I'm afraid. This has been a problem for, for many, many years. I know, and it, it, it's been a problem I've been involved with in my own constituency and have had the police councils, everyone involved, and it, it is really yeah. hard to pin down 
because it, it's yes. the evidence gathering part of it. So if there was yeah. something that could be put in here to strengthen that, that would be good also. Um, I just then want to ask you just to comment on the issue around um, small producers and small producers licensing. Um, you had put mm -hmm. in your the wording of produced in the production premises. Um, just mm -hmm. uh, just the, the caution around that. Could you go into a wee bit more detail on that? Um, I mean, we've, I've heard, you know, sort of over the last number of weeks talking about um, breweries working together. And, you know, I think that that is an absolutely fair point. Um, I think the problem, the issue there was in relation to the fact that we wouldn't want it to see, see it become a backdoor into um, not having to have a pub licence. Um, and somebody, for example, being able to say, to say that they were brewing um, and that they were a small brewer, but in reality they were just they had nothing to do with the the brewing process at all. But they were they were bottling or putting things into bottles, and then they were able to and then they were able to sell from their premises. I mean, I go no further than that. It was just a note of caution, rather than thinking it was going to turn into um, a massive difficulty. To be honest, would you would you recommend any different type of wording to it? Um, I know that tap rooms and the licenses for small producers are being discussed about are being discussed. I wouldn't, you know, having listened to the evidence over the last number of weeks, I wouldn't want to stop um, our local producers being able to do what they do in relation to working with other local producers. Um, I could certainly have a look at that again just to see, but it, it was really just to raise the, the issue that we didn't want. Um, people to protect, to basically to be pretend breweries, I suppose. But I suppose that would be in relation to how any new license was actually was actually framed. But I'm more than happy to have another look at that again. Okay. Look, thank you, Nicola, for answering so far. Um, my screen has gone off again here, so I know Kelly wants to come in. So sure, go to Kelly I, first. Can I come in on that? Just as on a that short part? on that point. Yes, yeah, certainly, Robin. Th thank you. Just a sh short point. Um, were the brewers? Uh, might cooperate together, would you be opposed to one brewer selling another brewer's product on his or her premises? When I talk about cooperation, I'm talking about in relation to the evidence that you've already heard, where local, where the small independent brewers say that often two of them will work together and share recipes. Um, I think where they are both involved in producing a particular product, then both of them should be able to sell that. But I wouldn't go so far as to say they should all be able to sell each other's products because that would then be replicating um, an off-sale license. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Robin. Okay, Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Nicola. Um, this type of information is key for us, and I just want to go back to, as we're talking about that at the moment, the local producers license at the moment, it, it still doesn't um, allow those producers to sell for consumption on their premises. Um, I'm just, just sort of reading between the lines, and please forgive me if I've picked this up wrong. Um, I'm sort of getting the impression that you guys are fine for these guys to sell off their premises, um, to have samples for their own products. How yes. do you think about them selling their own project, produce yeah. for consumption on the premises, yeah. given the caveat, that the, the caution that you've raised? Yes, um, thank you. Um, yes, you're you're picking up between the lines. Absolutely, absolutely right. And we would very much support what is in the bill um, in relation to sampling and selling off premises. We would have a real concern. I, mean, I can absolutely understand why why the issue is important to people, but we would have a real concern that they would duplicate what the pubs were 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 wanting to do. You know, we have the problem of restaurants selling outside their ancillary license. You know, if they were to be allowed tap room again, that would be ancillary to the brewing process. But who is going to place it? Um, you know, a few weeks ago, you heard um, very interesting evidence from the Society of Independent Brewers and the guy from, from Bristol, who was talking about 20 tap rooms in Bristol and selling, selling wine uh, and spirits as well. Um, you know, things can start with the absolute best of intentions. But we would have a real, real concern that it is going to duplicate what the pubs are doing. Um, and we really think that there's a real um, opportunity for them to work with the pubs um, because if, if products are good and they're selling, they'll absolutely be stopped. 
Yeah, and it's just that enforcement that, that has, has piqued my interest. Um, you talked about the Responsible Retailing Code, Northern Ireland. Yes. You know, yes. I've read through the details on that. And yes, absolutely, it's within the sector and there's, there's that commitment there to ensuring that it's the best possible system. But the teeth for that code... Yeah. Is, isn't there so you yes the, exactly find someone um in breach you know somebody who's not operating within the code um you yeah. can report them to the press the place oh sorry i'm just yeah. reading it um and so on um yeah. but it is then up to the place to take that forward i'm just thinking yeah. those local brewers are they part of that code at present or no okay no they wouldn't be because they're they're not really selling um, the code is meant to cover everybody with an on and off sales license and rest restaurants etc as well um, you know again that you know the code can change very quickly so if there was a need or a want to bring them within that that could be done um, that could be done very swiftly okay but I'm just actually thinking to give that code teeth because we know how effective it can be when you have from a bottom-up approach so the industry yeah. would be involved in developing the code but if there isn't a statutory or a legal footing for it yeah. then it, it sort of takes teeth in it it sounds like yes. big brother sort of point fingers at people um and i'm just wondering yes. would do you think that that responsible retailing code northern Ireland, and i've seen who's on the panel very impressive panel um would they want to become statutory yes um, they would want to be they would want to be given statutory regulation re, um, recognition absolutely because they don't they they recognize that what they can do when they find a licensee in breach is limited and they would like to be able to do more. Yeah, no, just to clarify, I'm not necessarily talking about them getting statutory reg recognition. I'm talking about mm -hmm. them becoming statutory. That means that it comes in-house to the department. I think we would definitely want to talk about how that would work because one of the benefits of having it non-statutory is that it can be changed very quickly. Um, it also doesn't cost the public purse a penny. Um, you know, we've, we've funded this and paid for it um, for the last 12 years. Um, so certainly willing to have, the, absolutely willing to have the conversation, but we just want to see how that would actually work in practice. Okay, it's just, I have a concern. Um, it's from, we're living in a litigious society now. Mm -hmm. If a department gave statutory sort of a nod to a retail and code that it didn't have control over, um, mm -hmm. then we just end up in court somewhere because it wouldn't have that legal footing. You know, it might be recognized by a department. I worked in, in transport and we had codes like that and it yeah. was made very clear to us that um, we could not have statutory recognition because it wasn't controlled by government and, and within mm -hmm. the legislation. So, uh, no, I can understand that. I think it is an effective um, retailing code. It, it reads really well. The, mm -hmm. the way the complaints are handled is great. Um, it would be good to see that extended if this this yes. bill doesn't include anything for those craft brewers. Um, yeah. But I noticed that the rest of your, it's just something as, as you've heard the, the presentations today, I'm going to be asking everybody about this. Um, that addiction mm -hmm. service it's obviously coming up and we know that you're supportive of the changes that are happening to license and drinking up time and so yeah. on but i'm just wondering if for those that have concerns about the impact of alcohol on others and i know that good good um, retailers don't you know they don't want to see anybody in trouble with alcohol um i'm just wondering about that levy i asked glenn about it before with retail and i would that cause an issue for yourselves if there was a, almost like the code of conduct or the the retailing code if um if there was like a uh, an industry-wide donation or would you want it to be that uh, yeah. a voluntary thing as opposed to a forced thing? I think I, I think we would have to see what was what were being proposed to be perfectly honest I mean they the, the retail the suppliers already put an awful lot of money into harm reduction um, you know the industry completely funds drink aware um, which is the independent sort of responsible drinking um, charity. Um, actually, the Drink Aware app, we were, I know you were talking earlier about drink, people drinking above the safe drinking guidelines and, and alcohol-related harm, etc. Um, I was told the other day at a Drink Aware meeting that the Drink Aware app, which, um, asks, which gets people to regulate, is actually the most downloaded drink app in the world. So that was that was quite interesting, um, and they they've been doing an awful lot of research into um, drinking habits during COVID as well. Um, and the preliminary and the preliminary results of that are actually very interesting. I mean, as people would no doubt think, drinking did absolutely increase during the first lockdown, but then interestingly, it dropped way off and reduced as people sort of thought, well, this is going to carry on for a while, so we better 
um, moderate ourselves a bit, but there'll be more, more information on that coming out shortly. Um, I think we'd have to look at a levy. A lot of money is already put in into um, harm reduction, and I, just have, I think we'd just have to see how that could be spread about. Yeah, no, no, that's a fair point, to be honest. And I just want, this is actually a question more for us as a committee. Um, I just want to check, do we know at this stage if Responsible Retailing Code and I have submitted a response directly to our, our, our request for information? Uh, we'll let you know by the end of the meeting. Can I give the, the guys a chance to have a look for that? Absolutely. But Thank you very much. John, Sorry, Sean's, I... Sean's shaking his head saying no, um, but we'll okay. get a definite answer for that. Okay. okay, no, Nicola, can I just say thank you? Um, look, your members, um, we know that they're trying to be as responsible as possible. It's sometimes out of their hands when, when yeah. others aren't legally. Um, and thank you very much. It's really, really useful um, response that you've provided for us. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, members, unfortunately, my screen is down again and I can't see if anybody else wants to ask questions. So I'm going to go very quickly um, to the members who haven't had a chance yet to just to see if they want to ask anything. Um, I'll go to Sinead first, if I can bring Sinead in and ask her if she's anything or just want us to move on. Uh, no, thanks, Chair. It's, it's just it's just on the, the issue of the levy, and it's it's more just a point, and um, because it was referenced in an earlier uh, submission about the gambling industry, there there is a levy with the gambling industry, but it's voluntary, and um, it's not a mandatory levy, um, and also I know in terms of this bill, uh, the PS and I have called for a levy to be introduced, but they're actually asking for it to, uh, to top up. Um, officers' wages uh, in terms of officers that have to will have to police uh, longer opening hours. So uh, it's just a point, just to point that out, and that's something we need to consider in these deliberations in terms of a levy. A levy. Okay, thank you, Sinead, for that information. Um, Mark, is there anything you wanted to bring up? Mark Durkin. No, I'm fine, Chair. Thank you. Just thanks for the presentation. Before. Thank you. Great, Mark. Thank you. Um, Karen, can I go to you? Karen, is there anything you wanted to ask or bring up? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Okay. Thank you. Great, Karen. Thank you. And then Alex. Alex, was there anything you wanted to ask or bring up? No, I'm okay. Thank you. That's good. Okay. All right, members. Look, thank you for that. Um, and again, then Nicola, thank you. Thank you for your briefing today and your submission. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye. Okay, members, we are going to, we're still having a bit of technical problems, but I'll do, if they're not sorted by the time um, our next witness session, um, if the witness has briefed us, um, I'll, I'll do that individually again with members uh, on Starleaf. Okay, we're going to move on then to agenda item six, then, which is Copeland Distillery Briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs. Um, members, there are no papers for this agenda item. It'll just be a briefing, um, oral briefing only. So can I welcome Gareth Irvine to the meeting? And Gareth, can I ask you then to brief the committee and you have up to 10 minutes to, to deliver a brief? Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Gareth, go ahead. Great, Thank, thanks for having me. Apologies, there's no brief, guys. It's been one of those weeks, unfortunately. But um, no, thanks for having me. This has been um, something that is quite, um, I suppose, for, well timed for, for me, um, not only as, as, a, as, a, as a fellow who owns a distillery, but also um, in terms of what we're going through um, of running a, a visitor centre. Um, it's, it doesn't take long to Google my name uh, and see how this bill has a, has a significant impact with um, current um, police inquiries. I was say, um, so you know, I, I'm more than happy to give my view and give my opinion in terms of how the change in licensing will affect my business and um, will affect tourism uh, and will, I suppose, be, be a better good for, for all communities and, and departments, I suppose. Um, look, my, I run a, a six and a half thousand square foot distillery in Donaghy. Um, the closest member to me is, is Alex Easton. Um, so I'm sure Alex knows firsthand um, the, the encouragement, I suppose, from, from, the, from the public uh, and the dismay as well from the public of what we can and can't do down here. Um, we invested just shy of probably a million pounds in, in this site in Donaghy, uh, which is an old council site. We, we signed a 125 year lease with the council. Um, and we, the fact that we wanted to create a new home for the distillery, um, we produce gin, rum, whiskey, uh, potting. Uh, we export majority of the product um, from, from Australia to Estonia to the UAE to France um, and the most recent Asia 
uh, and the US. So everything we produce, you know, and the vast majority of it um, gets shipped out. For the dismay in some of our um, tourist side of things is um, the impact of this bill um, of, you know, it's impossible and it's it's against the law to to sell effectively what we produce on site. It's it's not only mind boggling to people, but it's frustrating as well. It's frustrating from a business point of view for myself, um, and it's frustrating for my staff to have to explain continually why um, why why it is and what's going on. And we do chat about this bill, um, and I think everyone is is glad it's coming. Um, just from jumping on there, um, from listening to, to Nicola um, of, of a few kind of queries that she might have of, of local producers working with other breweries and, um, you know, how that looks. I, I understand the concerns. Um, I've got a good few friends and breweries and distilleries who have been on to have a conversation with you. Um, from uh, William Main from Bill House. Um, Will, William's probably the most vocal one you've maybe had on. Um, and also across the board from Hench Distillery to Boatyard, Ackenville, Mornjew, Bush Mills, Short Cross. We are all in the same boat um, and we're all in the same, we're all in the same sector and we're all of the same opinion as well. I think from my point of view, um, you know, this isn't just about the change that this will have from a commercial point of view on my business. Um, this is a change that this will have on staffing levels, on tourism aspects and um, on events and the wider picture. Um, not only for the next 125 years, but also within the short term, what we've got planned within Donaghy and within the community. I think from reading into this bill, it's a great start um, and we, we welcome it. Um, we, we welcome the, the change. Um, I understand the, 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 I suppose the angst from bars um, and, and people with licenses along the tap room argument um, and I think you know the, the brief conversation we've had with bar owners just in the town is they welcome the bill too they obviously welcome the the amendments to it and the changes to it um, but when you look at the wider picture which is what a lot of these breweries and distilleries want to um, chat about and, and go into further it's a, there's a huge social um, impact and hold a, a huge social change that will come from this um, there is a lot to learn. There is a lot to look into. You, you know, at the end of the day, this is a it's a huge power that you'd be giving to breweries, distilleries, and uh, producers. Um, and we all know that. We all know there's a there's a huge responsibility there, and we all know um, that there's a, a huge learning curve to have as well. Um, but we also see what the impact that will have. Um, I know firsthand. Um, I have a, a staff. Of ten, um, I know firsthand that whenever this bill comes to light, we will um, automatically take on three new three new employees within the town. Um, that is from a, a tourism point of view. That is from a, a social point of view, um, and we will open longer. Um, I think after the last twelve months through um, COVID, we, we've all learned that people in Northern Ireland are resilient, uh, and I think. You know, we have seen we have seen the I suppose the appreciation for local and supporting local and I think what this bill does not only supports my business going forward and supports my staff going forward but also supports the community going forward um, in terms of what we can do um, in terms of what we can um, not only sell within the within within the, the story but also what we can support and bring in there's a lot that we can't do um, we had the Secretary of State down with us um, two years ago. Um, we couldn't give him a gin and tonic <laughs> um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a freebie. Um, there's, there's a lot that we can't do and it's frustrating and it's confusing. Um, we're all used to it now, but I think this positive change is definitely what's needed. And from my side of things, it, it couldn't come at a better time. Um, and that's all I have to really say about this. Um, and that, that, that's my input uh, as far as I can say. Okay, Garth, look, thank you for that. And I mean, we all, well, I certainly know you're very well known distillery, so you are, and you know, very, very much part of that um, tourism model um, for your area that, where you're based there. And I know Donaghy is a small, close knit town. And I suppose I just want to ask you firstly what your relationship then is like 
um, with your the, with the various bars and restaurants around around you, and any conversations you have had with them um, uh, as to how it might impact on their business, or do they see it actually as a positive impact on their business? Um, that the increase in tourism will will have a knock-on effect on them. So I suppose just to expand a wee bit on that. Yes, of course. So um, to give you an idea, if you book a tour um, with Moodle Star, if you if you, if you book a, a two-hour tour, the way that currently works, well, sorry, the way it, it used to work before we've had to stop them, is you would you would arrive in the distillery and you would sit down in our visitor center, which seats about eighteen to twenty-four. Um, now it'll change a wee bit. You would get a quick chat about how we started, uh, about our history, um, and then you would go down to the production floor. Um, you would then come back up, grab your coat, grab whatever you've arrived with, and we would go over to Harbour and Company, which is the, the bar across the street from us. We we would go up to their very top room, which looks over the um, the, the Copeland Islands, and, and you would then start your, your tasting and your events. Um, we usually run those on a Friday, Two, two sessions on a Friday, two sessions on a Saturday, uh, and perhaps three. We don't do anything on a Sunday. We, we started those in September 2019. Um, we stopped doing those in February uh, 2020, roughly at, at the end of February. Over that period, we had about 52 tours, and we saw just over a 1,000 people come through our doors. Those 1,000 people weren't just locals from Donaghadee. Um, those were locals um, from the whole of Northern Ireland, people who had come down just for it, people who had booked rooms um, in the, the bars, in, in the hotels, um, in the B&Bs. Um, over Christmas period, we had a number of um, staff parties come down. Um, and after chatting to the bars and, and, the, and the, the bar owners and even the restaurants, there's not one bar owner in Donaghadee that would say that we have had a negative or a non-substantial impact, um, especially the, the, the ones in the close proximity. Um, to, give me, to give you an example, we had a, a, um, a party of 30 um, come over to us to get to have a quick tour um, for their staff party um, in 2019. Those 30 people then booked a um, book a table in the restaurant beside us. I would say, from a rule of thumb, eighty to ninety percent of people who come on a tour um, contribute positively to another business in town, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, if not more. Um, that's not only because we preach about the, the the brilliant town that we're in, but it's it's because you know we we leave people wanting to um, experience more in Donaghadee. And I think, you know, that there's a huge impact on um, not one bar owner um, would say otherwise. Okay, thank you. And I, I, I absolutely get that. And I can see how that would um, boost the, 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 the town completely, having your distillery base there. Um, just then want to ask you um, about the, the, as it stands, the bill is not allowing for, for tap rooms, but if it was to change, um, have you had any discussions again with your with the, 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 those other um, licensed premises around you? Uh, would it change your relationship with them, um, or do you feel that that could continue? Um, we will continue uh, to have a good relationship. And just to ask you as well, um, Gareth, do those local um, bars and restaurants within your vicinity stock your product? Yeah, so um, easy answers first for the second one uh, of whether they stock our product. Yes, every every retailer, every licensed premises stocks our product within Donaghadee, a majority of uh, Bangor and Newton Arts. Um, in terms of tap rooms, it, I don't need to say it's a contested um, question because it is. Um, you know, I, I understand the, um, I suppose, the desire for people breweries and bars to produce or to do or try the breweries to have tap rooms and the bars to object to them. I think from my point of view, and I have to be very selfish, um, you know, if we were looking at the tap room aspect for the distillery, um, it wouldn't be the same it wouldn't have the same commercial impact that it would on a brewery. Breweries rely on high volume and high, you know, high high, you know, high volume beers um, and lots of customers. We in the spirits game don't, um, and that's just that's just the nature of the beast. 
Um, while the rules or the legislation was to change to allow for more tap rooms, um, I think there's a way that can be looked at. Um, there's, a, there's a level of trust um, that I think needs to be understood from the, from the breweries, um, whether the tap rooms were limited to X times a year, whether um, they were limited to X people a year or areas. I think that's from the discussions I've had with breweries, that's, you know, that is the middle ground. It's not saying that's really tap rooms completely and it's not saying that's have tap rooms, you know, on a Monday, Tuesday to Sunday night, because um, that is a bar and that is a pub. Um, I think it would, depending on what the final outcome looks like for the tap room discussion, it would have an impact on, on um, breweries. And, and, sorry, it would have an impact on bars around here. Um, I, I can't give you an, an actual answer, I suppose, because I don't know what the, what the, what the nitty gritty of it looks like. Um, but yeah, in my opinion, it would, it would be beneficial to both parties. Um, you know, think about if you've been to the tap room that, uh, runs on the Newton Arch Road um, by Boundary Brewing. It brings in 70 plus people um, with other various businesses coming into it to develop, um, to do food for the night, for instance. And they run those across the weekend, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I know that those are vital to the to the breweries um, because a lot of the big pubs don't, you know, are, are run by the bigger breweries, the likes of Guinness and Heineken. And I know that they rely on these tap rooms to, to help with that business. Um, so I think, you know, you need to weigh up the ability to do tap rooms um, from a commercial point of view. Um, and I think the pubs would, would be more open to that um, occasional license or the occasional tap room than just a full tap room license. Okay, look, Gareth, thank you. Thank you for your answers. Um, I'm going to open up to members. Members, I still have a wee issue of, of not knowing who wants to speak or not, so I'm going to go back and do the every member part on Starleaf. Um, but I'm going to start the opposite way around, and I'm going to start um, with Alex, who I know has an office in Don Donaghadee. Mm -hmm. Alex, is there anything you want to ask of Gareth? Yeah, thank you, Gareth, for your presentation and um, your stories. Uh, it's it's great. It's, it gives local employment, and if we can get this bill right, then um, you know it, it could be an amazing opportunity for Donaghadee. Um, as you know, Donaghadee is an, an amazing place. Anyway, I'm not just saying that because it's in my constituency, but you know it, it's come on leaps and bounds in, in recent years, um, especially with the restaurants and, and the pubs. Um, this could be an added attraction to it. So, um, do, do you feel you could expand even more than the extra two or three jobs that you could create if we can get this right? Or, or yeah, if... um, we, I, I, we can't go into it too much just yet. Um, it, it's it's um, it's awaiting a number of approvals, but we are looking at potential um, development in terms of the site, in terms of Donaghadee. Um, this change in legislation would allow for development and planning to be a lot easier, it would allow it to be a lot smoother. Um, we, have a poten we have a number of potential plans um, that would rely on the development of this license, um, which would rely on um, the, the development and the, the, the ability for us to sell our own product. There's no doubt about that. Um, and yeah, it would, it would significantly increase um, in terms of what we could do, in terms of what we can employ, um, without a shadow of a doubt, yeah, no problem. Yeah, definitely. Okay, you keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Okay, I'm going to go to Karen and ask Karen if she has any question or comment she wants to make. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I don't have any questions, just um, listen to Gareth, I really want to come to Donica Day now and, and visit, so hopefully Gareth in the summer, um, we'll see, or not maybe as far as the summer, we'll see this lifted, um, as I say, really interesting and thank you for your presentation um, today because you've given me a greater understanding um, and as we work our way through this, uh, I, I think it'll be very useful, so thanks again Gareth. Thank you, Karen. I, I think we maybe need to look at retrospective visits on this <laughs> committee for committee visits on this bill because um, we may have finished the bill before everything's lifted. Um, can I then move on to Mark and ask Mark if he any comments or question? 
Mark, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Chair. Uh, thanks to Gareth for the, the presentation. I've, I've no specific questions to Gareth. We, we, we've heard from a lot of his counterparts, you know, and other brewers. It's not them giving any, any, any preference over you, but, but the, this, this issue is certainly one that's uh, given us as a committee a lot of uh, food, food for thought. Uh, I think it's probably taken up most of our time thus far at, at, at the committee stage, and, and I think that's reflective of, of the, the value that we're putting on the, the case that you guys are putting forward. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Um, can I go then to Sinead and ask Sinead if you have any comment or question? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Gareth. Yeah, I think um, I concur with uh, Karen's remarks there. I think we need some retrospective um, visits uh, to some of these breweries. But no, listen, again, and the committee will know this, I have a number of good, good local brewers beside um, myself here in South Down, Moore Mountain and Cologne Distillery, um, to name a few. So, um, you know, I fully understand, I appreciate the, the issues. Um, and, I, and I've said it before, I think, um, our local breweries could play a huge part in terms of um, growing and expanding our tourism product here. Um, so that has to be uh, paramount in our in our deliberations. Um, so no, listen, thanks thanks very much for the um, the uh, presentation. Um, it's it's been very useful. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, I'm going to go to Kelly. Kelly, any comments or questions? Yes, Chair. Actually, I do have a couple of questions for Gareth. Gareth, thank you very much for coming along. Um, Koblenz, while it's not in the Stanford constituency, it's not too far up the road from me. Gareth, I just wanted to double check. Um, yeah. The presentations that we've received from others um, who wouldn't necessarily be in favour of, of tap rooms having a licence in Northern Ireland have suggested that these occasional licences are the way forward. Can you just spell out for us why? What do you think about those occasional licences? I think it was a yeah um, totally now my my view on occasional licenses are are they're too flexible based on the area that you're in to give you an idea I don't know how au fait you are with occasional licenses but um in Donaghadee and, and especially North Down which is why I'm being pulled to the courts currently and I'll just be totally honest with you it's all to do with the perspective of of the police officer and how those occasional licenses are used. There needs to be a review done on occasional licences and their their ability and their their view on on their use. In my opinion, um, for for an occasional licence to be levied in Belfast to run a tap room, um, isn't the exact requirement or uh, it isn't it isn't the point of occasional licences. The point, as we all know, the point of occasional licences is for anything community charity. Um, or event focused. Um, these occasional licenses that are available 12 a year um, are not fit for purpose. Um, they're not fit, in, in my view, uh, in, for, for my business, uh, for where I stand. Don't get me wrong, if I was, if I was based somewhere else in, in, rather than not North Down, um, I might have a different view. But I think the occasional licenses, is, as long as they're, they're there, and they're still based on the same legislation. They are not fit for purpose, um, from my point of view, and that's that's my that's my personal perspective on from a business point of view. We have used them in the past. We've used them for different events. We've been declined them for charity events, um, and we've been uh, we've been on the other end of them um, and, and used them with other breweries for certain events as well. Bull House, for instance. Um, so no occasional licenses. Yeah, I'm I'm fairly familiar with them. Do I agree with them? In principle, yes. Um, are they fit for purpose? No. So from your point of view as a business in Northern Ireland, developing a local Northern Ireland product, um, it's it would be just easier if there was a licence for your particular type of business um, rather than having to depend on occasional licences that are not currently. When you say that they're not fit for purpose, um, just expand, explain that slightly just so that, that we know. Uh, please forgive me. I'm... I'm I'm not over every single detail of the legislation on occasional licences, um, and I say that because it's so complex, um, not because I don't know what it's in it, but it just explain from your point of view why they're not fit for purpose. Yes, of course. So occasional licences, if I want to get an occasional licence in, in the distillery, an occasional licence lasts uh, six days from memory, um, six days for in, in one period. Okay. For that licence, um, I need to be running a a, if I want to run an event, say I want to run a tap room, um, based on my um, area, 
Um, that occasional license, if I put in tap room on the occasional license or um, open day, for instance, on the reason for wanting an occasional license, if I put that into the, the, the police department, which is a banger for me, um, that would be declined. If I, if I was in Belfast and I put the same license into Belfast with the same um, explanation of why I want it, tap room or um, open day, that would be, that would be accepted. Um, there's no black and white with the occasional license. It, it's, it is a grey application. Um, I make no, um, I make, I make no issue saying that. They're, they're not fit for purpose for where I am. And if, if there was a occasional license, or not even occasional license, if there was a producer's or a producer's license, um, it would be one hundred percent accurate you know there, there's no swan from the legislation a bit like how it is now with with alcohol licensing you know there, there's no interpretation that comes into it whereas with the occasional license there is um and the, the people unfortunately who, who have that interpretation are the psni and i think there's too much flexibility across northern ireland for breweries and distilleries to rely on occasional licenses and i could give you 30 examples of how that is yeah no thank you very much for that i think it is something that, that we're definitely considering um how it'll fit into the bill we'll, we'll get to that sometime but um yeah no thank you very much for that guy i don't have too much more or anything more to ask you actually because there's been there's been quite a lot of presentations on that um well sorry just one thing um so i just want to check so at currently um if there was a tap room license Okay, so that would have to go through planning permission, um, and anyone can put in objections. Of course, that's that's a process. That's that's how we work. Um, at the moment, when somebody applies for a liquor license, um, I'm under the impression that just one objection, you know, makes more investigations happening. Um, I'm not sure whether that's entirely fair because you could have, you know, one organisation complains about any application for a license. Have you any concerns if that was to happen with tap rooms? Um, I, I haven't seen the tap room um, yeah. offer, so I, I couldn't I couldn't accurately um, comment on it. Um, it you're, you're right. Um, if I was to pull, if I was to buy a bar in Balmahinch and pull their license down to Donaghadee, does one objection from one of the bars? Um, make that a lot harder, both financially and from a time point of view. It, it, you're right, it does. Um, is that the same process with planning if you're building a house? No. Um, I think, you know, as, as a whole, the planning, um, or sorry, the, the, the licensing application area in no and again, in my opinion, isn't fit for purpose. Um, I understand why if bars invest £150,000 in a license, why they would want to protect that asset. Um, we, are not, we are not asking for a bar license. You know, I, I've had the bar owners in Donaghy come into the distillery, see our visitor centre in our area, um, and you can quite clearly see, same for tap rooms um, and same for breweries, that we are not fit to run um, full-blown bars and restaurants and things like that. It's not what we want to do. It's not our bread and butter. At, a, at the end of the day, our main focus is on producing the best spirits and beers to export across the world. Um, the ability to sell our product is only but a positive and only but an advantage. Um, it is not our sole business. And I think that's, you know, that is the key message that needs battered down here, is that we are, we are focused on producing spirits and beer and ciders. Um, we just want to be able to add further investment and add further employment to the, the businesses that we've built by doing the, the tap room, the occasional tap room or, you know, the producer's license. No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Gareth. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, it hasn't been an easy time this last year. Um, my thoughts are with you and, and all the guys that work with you. Thank you very much. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Um, just on the back then of, of what Kelly was asking there and your answers, Gareth, would it be possible? And I know that there's time constraints on everybody. If you could have a chat then, I, I mean, you're, you obviously do talk to other distillers and breweries across the entire Northern Ireland. Um, just around that occasional licence issue, um, just if you could have a chat with them and if, if someone could put in, you know, some sort of letter back to the committee just on, on the experiences, uh, on, you know, depending on, on the various districts, uh, across Northern Ireland, um, it would be useful 
um, for us as well, just on any decisions that we have to make going forward. If that's okay. if I can ask you to do that, and I know I'm, I'm asking you to take up some time to do that, but it would be interesting for us to learn back from right across the board. Yeah, that's, that's no problem. I mean, I, I know we're looking at more so breweries than distilleries. To be honest, there's more distilleries with licenses than breweries with licenses, but I, I'm more than happy to, to pull together a bit of an overview. Um, it will be hard. Um, not everyone will be probably as open as me, but not everyone has been pulled through the court by me uh, or at the minute. So look, I'm happy to I'm happy to, to lead on that and get you something across um, as soon as I can. Um, I, I've just realised I've, I've made a wee note as well, which if I could raise um, that Nicola Carruthers um, brought yep, up. Absolutely, go ahead. Um, she Nicola mentioned the um, the concern she might have on pretend breweries or breweries that might. Um, be home brewers and have um, a small brewery in the back of their bar with a full blown bar in the front that they've merely camouflaged to get through. Um, I would I would love to pull together something as well. Um, we as a as a as a distillery um, as an as an HMRC operated site um, go through a, a, a fierce amount of legislation um, and box ticking and record keeping to enable us to produce alcohol. Um, you know, our, our, our duty bill throughout the year, just for spurts, as well over what, um, as well over any of all our costs from rent to staff, you know, it's it's in excess of, you know, 300,000 pounds a year in duty alone for HMRC. The, the, the idea that a, a brewery can be a pretend brewery um, or, <laughs> a non, um, non-essential brewery with a bar at the front, in my opinion, um, is a non, it's, it's a nonsensical argument um, and it, it doesn't, it shouldn't even be brought up. Um, there, 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 there might be a minimum production level for a brewery. Um, no brewery will operate without, you know, at least 5,000 hectoliters of beer per, production capacity, same for me. Um, it wouldn't be cost effective to put a small distillery uh, in a building and, and call it a pub. Um, from an HMRC and a legislative point of view, it wouldn't make any sense. So I think um, from that aspect that, that Nicola brought up, um, I don't think it's well, it should be brought into um, much concern. No, and thank you for that, Gareth. I know we have heard when we've heard from the various breweries that have come in to give evidence, just the hoops that they have to jump through um, yeah. And with registration, with time, with money, all of that. Um, so no, I absolutely get that. That uh, yeah, I don't. I don't see that that issue that Nicol brought up being 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 an issue. Um, and yeah. I'm glad you were able to come back and just clarify that because we have heard that in the past uh, from other brewers as well. Look, Garth, I'm finished, and there's no other. Nobody else wants to ask any further questions. Can I thank you very, very much? I think you're our first distiller to come in and brief us, and uh, and just wish you every success with your business. I, I think it's fantastic uh, entrepreneurship that we much. have here in Northern Ireland. So, um, and the committee will want to do all it can um, to help you in in the success of your business. So, thank you. No, thank you. I much appreciate, and I think we have any help. Um, more than happy to. To, to help on, on, on talk again. Um, but I, I will certainly talk to the other distillers um, and get you a bit of an overview from an occasional license point of view in terms of the uh, the accuracy of them and the, the helpfulness of them. I know, yeah, I thought you were going to offer to do another job there for us, Gareth, but <laughs> it could be enough. No, look, thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Bye bye. Okay, members, um, we still have an issue with our system here, so I'll probably ask that all members are just brought into the spotlight for the remainder of, so members, we can hear you, just, just to let you know that. You're all brought into the spotlight now just for the remainder of, of all the agenda items. So I'm going to move on then to agenda item number 10, which is uh, SL1, Rumble Park Stadium, designation as an outdoor stadium for the purposes of liquor licensing legislation. Um, the proposed rule is at 156 and will designate Rumble Park as an outdoor stadium of importance to the whole of Northern Ireland. Can I ask our members any comments? Are we content to note, um, or for, sorry, for the department to proceed to make the rule? Happy enough? Agreed. Agreed. Good, thank you. 
Agenda item 11, SL1, the Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule is at 159 of your pack. It will specify the percentage by which the guaranteed minimum pension element of an individual's occupational pension entitlement is increased with effect from the 6th of April 2021. Again, members, are you content for the Department to proceed to make this rule? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Agenda item 12, SL1, the automatic enrolment earnings trigger and qualifying earnings band order in Northern Ireland 2021. This proposed rule is at page 164 and will set out the amount of the upper limit of the automatic enrolment qualifying earnings band for the 2021-2022 year in line with the upper national insurance contributions earning limit for that year. Again, <coughs> members, are you content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Agenda item 13, SL1, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pensions Levy Ceiling Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, members, apologies, this SL1 was included twice in your pack in error. Um, the proposed rule is at page 169 and will specify the Pension Protection Fund Levy Ceiling for the financial year beginning on the 1st of, year, 1st of April 2021. Again, members, can I ask, are you content for the Department to proceed to make this rule? Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item 14, which is SL1, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factor Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Again, apologies, members, uh, this was duplicated as well in your meeting pack. Um, the proposed rule is at page 174 and will provide that earning factors relating to national insurance contributions for historic tax years used in the calculation of additional pen state pension and guaranteed. Right, members, read that again. Can you just remember, we can hear you, so if you can keep your sound down to a minimum. The proposed rule is at page 174 and will provide that earning, earnings factors relating to national insurance contributions for historic tax years used in the calculation of additional state pension and guaranteed minimum pensions um, maintain their value in line with the increase in average earnings. So can I ask members, are you content for the department to proceed and make that rule also? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item 15, which is SR 2021 forward slash 14, the housing benefit and universal credit housing costs, executive determinations, modification regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Members will find this SR at page 189 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, have you any objection to this rule? No. No, no objections? Okay, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-14, the Housing Benefit and Universal Credit Housing Costs, Executive Determinations, Modification Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. We'll move on then to agenda item 16, which is SR 2021-15, the Social Fund Funeral Expenses Payment Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Members, this SR will find at page 197 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, have you any objections to this rule? Great. No objections? No. Okay, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-15, the Social Fund Funeral Expenses Payment Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we'll move on then to agenda item 17, which is our forward work programme. Can I inform members that at our meeting next week on the 11th of February, we will be briefed by the Minister on the regional and sub-regional stadium programme. This briefing will start at 9 a.m. and finish at 9.30, as the Minister has to attend an executive meeting. Um, the Minister has also let us know that she's unavailable for any other Thursdays in the month of February. So I just want to then seek, uh, I know we had spoken about it before, but if we can go ahead and try and get a briefing on the Wednesday with the Minister, um, albeit it will not be a formal meeting, but it will be brought back to the committee. Are members agreed with that? Do we proceed with that? Agreed. Great. Can great. I, yeah, great, okay. And also then, just on our forward work programme, the committee then will be briefed next week also by the following organisations in relation to the licensing and registration of clubs. Amendment Bill, we will hear from the from Food NI, the Law Society of Northern Ireland and the Federation of Small Businesses. Mm -hmm. Any Chair? No. 
Sorry. Thank you. I'm dropping out. I'm dropping out, okay. All right, I'm, I'll move a bit closer to my microphone. Um, just to let you know that next week also we have a brief on the bill by Food NI, the Law Society of Northern Ireland and the Federation of Small Businesses. Did you hear that okay? Mm. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any comments or happy to move on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll go to agenda item 18, which is correspondence. Um, members, the correspondence memo you'll find at page 206 of your pack. I just want to draw attention to one item, and that is the department's paper on the def definition of affordable housing. And you'll find that at page 300. Um, the department's proposed de definition of affordable housing is social rented housing or intermediate housing for sale or intermediate housing for rent. Um, that is provided outside the general market for those whose needs are not met by the market. Affordable housing, which is funded by government, must remain affordable or alternatively there must be provision for public subsidy um, to be repaid or recycled in the provision of new affordable housing. The Minister has indicated that she is content with the proposed wording and the Department now intends to proceed with the definition and accompanying explanatory note and will update the Housing Association Guide to reflect these proposals. Furthermore, the guide will be updated with new intermediate housing products as they are developed and become available. Members, are you, uh, do you want to reply to the Department? to advise that uh, we're content with that definition. So a definition of intermediate? Yes. A definition of affordable housing. The only thing I was going to ask, Chair, is you see um, provided for sale. I'm assuming that this is being brought forward um, uh, for the, the, the next uh, provisions of buy to or rent to buy or whatever provisions are coming forward. Um, yeah, that's I'm, how I'm it reads to me. That's how I read mm -hmm. it as well, Kelly. That's um, okay then. Oh, yeah, it's general enough, but I agree with Mark. We need to know what that um, intermediate means. Okay, well, we can um, certainly ask for that clarification on that first, if you want to, and we'll bring it back next week. Yeah? yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, then any, I will open to members. Anything that anybody wants to bring up in correspondence? Are you content with the memo as drafted? Are as amended, yep, yeah, content. Okay. Um, I'll move on then to agenda item 19, which is any other business. And I know Robin had uh, ident or said to me earlier he wanted to bring something up. Robin? I do, Chair. It's actually, two matters. One, one that arose during the course of the meeting. Um, I understand that the department had uh, encouraged uh, all of the district councils to provide a labour market partnership plan and have just informed the councils uh, and had asked them to submit that plan by the 5th of February. I understand that councils have just been told that there is no money for uh, the Labour Market Partnership Plan. I wonder could we just seek clarification from the department um, as to the reason why the plan was asked for and why all of a sudden uh, there, there's no funding uh, to, to support it, given that the deadline was, was tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, uh, no, can I right. ask you on, on that, Chair, and if, if, the me if the members would agree, agree to that? Can I, Chair, yesterday at the uh, Education Committee there was a, a significant debate uh, which was uh, uh, highlighted by Professor Siobhan O'Neill, who is obviously, as you all know, the uh, mental health champion was was talking with the committee about the reopening of schools, uh, and I think we we already know that we have we we have a a mental health problem. Uh, she was expressing concern about the the mental health problem of uh, pupils having been in the two periods of lockdown, and indeed was indicating uh, a need to address the return to school not just uh, on an academic basis, uh, but, but indeed indicating that uh, she felt that there were other matters that needed to be addressed, the physical uh, aspects of, of the lockdown, the mental health aspects of the lockdown. 
Uh, and Professor O'Neill had been indicating that uh, she felt sure that there would be a need for our pupils to be involved in uh, work activities other than the pure academic subjects that are likely to involve the community sector, the health sector, uh, operating in a holistic manner along with the education sector. I wonder, Chair, uh, if we could uh, write, uh, and that, 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 that indeed might be uh, involving education, finance, health and, and communities. This return to school, I think, Chair, is, is going to be a, a significant uh, issue. But I wonder, Chair, could we perhaps write to the department or write to the minister, whichever you feel, uh, indicating whether or not there would be a willingness to look at a combined uh, approach to the return of the pupils to school. Okay. No, that, I mean, that's perfectly valid. Both of those issues are perfectly valid points. Um, I, I just want to ask members on the first issue that Robin brought up there to do with the councils and that funding issue. Are you happy enough that we write back to the department on that issue first and foremost? Yes? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And then the second issue, I think that's a valid point. Um, that certainly um, when we look at, at all those issues to do whether it's child poverty, whether you know a lot of the social issues um, fall under our, our department as well and I do think there will need to be a, a holistic approach, albeit that education will have to lead on it, but there should be a holistic approach whenever we look at, at, at children and their mental health and, and, um, and society in general moving out of lockdown so I'm happy enough um, with that proposal to write to our, our own department and minister as well on that issue. Members, any comments on that? Or happy enough to move on with that? Agreed. Agreed? Okay. All right, members. Excuse me, Chair. Sorry, one moment. Janice wants to say something. Could I just take you back to the issue before of intermediate housing? There is a definition of intermediate housing on page four of the department's document. If you want me, I'll read it out now, or you, members can look at it and uh, the member who's interested could come back and say, are they content with that definition? Yeah, I think it was Mark well, and Kelly. Did you hear that? Uh, I had the switch device and I'd read it through, so I don't have the paper in front okay, of me. Okay, if it's just, uh, do you want to read it out? Sorry, can I just, just before we go to Janice's issue, the final issue then with Robin about the education, did we get agreement uh, on, on that plan moving forward, looking at a holistic approach and being part of that approach? Can we get agreement on that first? Yes. Did we? Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Right, well, yeah. if we'll move back to the intermediate. Janice, do you want to read it out, what it says for the members? Um, it's just on page four of, of the documentation from the department. Intermediate housing consists of shared ownership housing provided through a registered housing association, e.g. co-ownership housing association, and helps households who can afford a small mortgage but that are not able to afford to buy a property outright. The property is split between part ownership by the householder and part social renting from the registered housing association. The proportion of property ownership and renting can vary depending on householder circumstances and preferences. This definition of intermediate housing used for the purpose of this policy may change over time to incorporate other forms of housing tenure below open market rates. Okay, members, does that make that a bit clearer? I know Mark, you had brought up the issue. I'm going to be a real puke now. If I'm small, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a small mortgage, what is that? You know, is there a threshold? Yeah. It's different yeah. in different places. Um, Okay, look, we, can, we, can, we can ask for a bit more detail on that and get that brought back next week. That's not a problem. Are members Thank content you. with that? Yeah? Okay, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, can I move on then? AOB finished. Can I move on then to agenda item 20, members? Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry go Chair, ahead, Mark. Sorry, go ahead. I hand up there for one more bit of AOB. And now we might have done this before as a committee. It's been a, a crazy, a crazy uh, year. I just came to the fore again uh, last week with the very welcome announcement from the Health Minister of the recognition payment for, for health workers and that uh, people concerned about any potential impact on their universal credit uh, and, and benefits. Now, I know there have been other issues that have arisen with be it the, the grant for taxi drivers and, and other financial assistance that has come from the various schemes from various departments. Now, I know the Finance Minister is undertaking the right to the Treasury to ensure that these awards aren't taxable or what have you. But could we maybe write to the Minister to see 
or ask her to take every step that she can to ensure that there isn't any negative impact uh, on, on people, it's particularly I think uh, those health workers who are getting this recognition, that it isn't just going into one pocket and being taken out of another. I think that's a very good point, Mark. Um, I mean, it just would be a slap on the face for that to happen. Um, so, yep, we can certainly write about that. Yep. Anything else members want to bring up under AOB? Nope. Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item 20, which is date, time and location of next meeting. Members, we will meet here in room 29 next Thursday, the 11th of February 2021, and our meeting will start at 9 a.m. Okay, members, thank you. Thank you. Northern Ireland Thank Assembly you. Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.